can okay. see one day. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it sounds like more people are going to be jumping on. So we can go ahead and just record this first bit. Um, and then we can kind of move on from there then. So let me share my screen. Give me just one second. So I think we've stalled enough. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay. Now. Screen. Okay. Can everybody see the screen right now? It's, it's not gone to share screen yet. There you go. It's pacing modes and codes. Perfect. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. So I'll go ahead and jump in. If people need let in, please let me know because I can't really see that using my tiny screen right now and my presentation. So um, we'll be happy to add them as they come though. All right. Pacing modes and codes. So if you remember where we left off, um, we spoke about bradycardia, the indications um, for pacers, and then we're just going to move on to the NBG codes. So <clears throat> the NBG codes is just a way to kind of classify the mode that a current pacemaker is set to. So the limiting factors, let me let this person in, um, the limiting factors for what code you select is the hardware itself. So is this a single chamber device? Um, and then also things to keep in mind is, are there issues with existing leads? So we can program a dual chamber device to act like a single chamber device. Um, we cannot program a single chamber device to act like a dual. I know that makes sense, but I felt like I should cover it. So the way that what these things represent, VVI, DDD, all these things that we'll go through later, um, is based on their position. So when you look at chamber one, for example, if you see a V in chamber one, that means it paces in the ventricle. So anything, um, the chamber that it paces in will be the first position. Second position will be the chamber that it senses in. Third position will be its response to that sensing. And then the fourth position is just rate modulation. Um, that's whether or not a sensor-driven rate for chronotropically incompetent patients. Um, is turned on. And I'll cover that later. And there's plenty of examples for this if you didn't quite catch all that. So um, in this case, let's move along. The most simple one you'll probably ever come across is a VOO device. So what that means, if you remember up here, it paces in the ventricle only. It senses in the ventricle none of the time, and it doesn't respond to any kind of sensing because there's nothing to respond to. So basically what that means is that the device is completely blind and it just paces at a steady rate. So when we talk about like a base rate of 60 beats a minute, remember that pacemakers do not think in BPM like a human mind does. They think about it in milliseconds. A pacemaker is just a bunch of little clocks that all kind of start and stop at different times. And we can go over that in later lectures, but um, essentially what you're saying is if a device is set VOO 60, for example, the device waits 1000 milliseconds. And if you ever need to do the math for this, it's uh, to figure out the milliseconds, it's 60,000 divided by BPM equals milliseconds. So in this case, 60 beats a minute is 60,000 divided by 60 equals 1000 milliseconds. So in this case, programmed VOO60 means it paces. In this case, you see it captured. It waits a thousand milliseconds or the equivalent of 60 BPM and it paces again. Now, right here is a little odd. Like what are we seeing here? This is an EKG and why are we not seeing an evoked response? Well, this is an intrinsic QRS complex, obviously. The device is set to not pay any kind of attention to anything that's happening and pace no matter what. So it paces, Unfortunately, it kind of paces into a T wave, which is not ideal because this can be prorhythmic, um, but it doesn't really know any better. It resets the timer, waits a thousand milliseconds and paces again. Now in this case, you see a preceding uh, P or atrial activity right here, followed by the depolarization. Here's a pace. It waits a thousand milliseconds, paces again. Now you see the morphology is a little different. This would be an idea, you may hear the term fusion. Um, so what's happening here is we're pacing. At the same time, you have this intrinsic um, atrial activity 
it conducts down. If you remember last week, we were talking about uh, the atria and let's go ahead and draw. I got a pen and I got time to stretch it out. Um, so you have your beautifully drawn heart here. You have your upper chambers. So your RA, I'm not gonna bother writing anything else out because this is incredibly tenuous. Um, you have your SA node, you have your AV node, and then um, you have your bundle of his to your, ignore that this is outside the heart. Um, <clears throat> so this is your standard conduction system of the heart, right? So you have your atrial activity occurs, it conducts to the AV node, it hits a slight delay, and then it moves its way down the normal conduction system to depolarize the ventricles, right? Well, in this case, we are pacing at the exact same time in the RV. So you have this intrinsic conduction causing depolarization and this pacing that fuses at the same time. So anytime you see anything like this right here, this is a fusion because you're having the intrinsic activity complement our pacing activity. Um, you may hear a term called pseudo fusion. That just looks like we might have fused, but the complex will look exactly the same. Does anyone have any questions on that? I can belabor this point or, or move along if anyone doesn't have any questions. Please, please you can belabor it, right? I'm sorry? You can go ahead and explain, please. Okay. The difference between the pseudo and the fusion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so for those of us like uh, Elvis who are taking the IBHRE, which is a very fun test, um, but um, this will be something that will come up. And basically you'll see this manifest itself in a pseudo fusion where we'll have a pacing spike occur directly before a QRS, but the morphology of the QRS looks exactly like the intrinsic morphology. So there is no contribution of the pacing to the actual um, cardiac activity or to the EKG, um, to the electrical function of the heart. Versus a fusion, you have your pacing spike occur and you have the contribution of the intrinsic conduction that will affect the way the, uh, the entire electrical impulse travels throughout the heart. This will usually manifest itself as more narrow than a um, intrinsic or a, tor a typical pace or a PVC in this case as well. You see these wider complexes. Um, so in general, when you see a true fusion, you have a hybrid look to it. So you'll end up being a more narrow, but maybe not as narrow as an intrinsic um, than the normal paced event. But um, that's just a contributing very factor of the two kind of occurring at the same time. So I know this is kind of roundabout in a, in a little segue here, but uh, I got a little, you know, distracted here. But in general, what we're seeing in VOO, and you'll see a lot of this weird stuff, and that is a, that is one inherent problem with VOO, right, is the device doesn't know any better. It just paces 60 beats a minute, if that's how it's programmed, forever. Now, the reason you may ask yourself, why do we choose VOO then at all? Uh, there could be a number of factors. If the patient's going in for surgery, electrocartery can cause the device to withhold pacing. So if you have a dependent patient who is going in for a shoulder surgery, for example, that electrocartery could confuse the device that this intrinsic noise here is actually a QRS complex, which will reset a timer on a pacer it will wait and withhold a pace. So if this cartery is still going on, you could have a 10 second pause, which is generally not ideal for most people. Um, so in those cases, we'll program the device VOO or asynchronous. So no matter what, it will pace, it will not sense, and it will not respond to any sensing. Finally, we don't have rate modulation on, we'll talk about that later. But this is your most basic sense. And um, the only time you'll ever see it you know, clinically outside of um, a surgical setting would be if a patient has um, issues with their lead, where we're worried that over sensing due to noise or anything like that could cause the device to inhibit. So dependent patients with noise issues on the ventricular lead, you may set them VOO as a bridge to a lead revision. Um, and it's just a way to make sure that um, you know, we're not inhibiting when they're in the field, causing any kind of syncope or, or dangerous events to occur. Everything makes sense there? 
pretty straightforward. Yes, yes, yes. Cool. Yes, yes. Um, but I have a question. Can I? Yes, sir. Ask? All right. So, uh, regards to lower rates, you know, perhaps for surgery, you change to VOO. Um, if it's a double chamber device, right, or if it's a single chamber device, would it add up a deal of VOO? Would mm -hmm. you also adjust the lower rate? Would, would that be necessary to reduce perhaps uh, the competition between the increased take and the device in case of, uh, depending on the indication for the, the for the um, pacemaker? Yeah, no, that's, that's, yeah, that is absolutely a really good uh, point and you would typically. So, um, if a patient's going in for surgery, for example, and even though they're dependent, we know they have PVCs or um, they're not dependent, but they have intermittent pauses that are relatively frequent. So we decided to put them asynchronous. My recommendation would be to go VOO 80, VOO 85, 90 even, um, maybe even 100 in some cases. And the reason being, as you said, to limit the instance of this competitive pacing. Um, anytime you're pacing into a T wave, you run the risk of being prorhythmic. So you could pace them into VT or to VF. Um, so in those cases, that is why we would increase the heart rate. The idea being that we would beat out any kind of intrinsic activity um, and we would uh, beat out any kind of PVCs because you're controlling the refractory period of the tissue. And by doing that, you limit the, the instance of uh, that occurring. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, thank you. Yeah, perfect. No, that was a, that was a great question. Um, so VVI. So VVI is your next step of complexity, and it's still pretty straightforward. Um, Elvis, do you want to take a shot at what this does? Uh, okay. We VVI we're pacing in the ventricle mm -hmm. as well as tensing in the ventricle, and then responding to whatever goes on in the ventricle. There's a sense. To, um, if there's an intrinsic um, beat, the device will be inbeated and deliver a pace. But if there's no intrinsic activity, it will count down and then deliver a pace. Yep, that's a, that's exactly it. So um, exactly as Elvis said, we are pacing the ventricle, we are sensing in the ventricle, and then we're responding to those sensing um, with inhibition if an event is occurring. And the reason being is because we don't want to be prorhythmic, because we don't want to risk um, pacing the patient into refractory periods um, or into vulnerable periods that could kick off any kind of arrhythmia. Um, so in this case right here, the device is set VVI. And judging from the timing, this is about 60 beats a minute or 1,000 milliseconds. So <clears throat> a ventricular event is sensed. This sets a clock of a thousand milliseconds. So that means the device is going to go ahead and pace at, uh, let's see, 300, uh, three, one, seven, five, 60. So we're, the device is probably gonna pace around here. Let's see if I can count. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. I cannot count today. The device was going to pace right here. Uh, we're, we're planned to pace. However, an intrinsic event occurred. It doesn't know this at all. So this, What's happening in the atrium, the device has no clue at all. Um, this is your P wave. However, it does have that lead in the ventricle. It senses on the ventricle a QRS complex. It resets the timer to 1,000 milliseconds, and it goes, now let me let Dr. Daffy in, 1,000 milliseconds from when the sensed event occurred, it waits, Nothing occurs in the ventricle, so it paces right here. That resets the timer, 1,000 milliseconds. It waits, nothing occurs, paces again. Resets the timer. Something is sensed right here, so it says, oh, this is intrinsic. So it resets the timer 1,000 milliseconds from the sensed event and paces again. Um, once again, this is a very simplified form. Um, this is one of the easiest ones to program, one of the easiest ones to understand what the device is doing. Um, and yeah, this is what you'll see a lot of times in patients who are chronic AFib or patients who don't require a lot of pacing. 
they just need occasional support. You may just put in a single chamber device because it's the easiest thing to do. And it's a lot cheaper than adding an extra atrial lead, having a more complex device. So everybody on page here. Perfect. Next, we go to AOO. Um, very similar to. Uh, AJ, sorry, please. Uh, if we go back to the previous slide, uh -huh. uh, there's been this um, question about the T mm -hmm. for the third category as a trigger. Usually, we don't see devices programmed that way, I guess. So, uh, can you just throw some light to? That T, how does it work? Uh, oh, the trigger pacing here? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so we can actually, I don't know if there's a slide on this later, but we'll go ahead and hit on it now. Um, so what, what trigger does is instead of causing inhibition, it causes pacing. So you may see a patient come in with VVT and you're like, what does this do? Um, a reason for this is instead of going um, VOO, for example, um, and inhibiting or pacing no matter what, what we can tell the device to do is when it senses anything on the ventricular channel, it should also pace. So if this occurs right here, it will, let me let them in. There we go. It will go ahead. As soon as it senses, it will also give a pacing spike. Oops, a little off center here, but you may end up with something that kind of looks like a fusion right here, where we will be pacing into this intrinsic complex, um, not obviously in the vulnerable period here, because this is a big no-no, we don't want to do that, um, but instead trying to kind of fuse with the intrinsic. A couple of reasons you may do this, uh, if they have a bi-V and they have a lot of ectopy, but we're not atrially tracking and we're say they have bi-V with AFib with RVR or lots of PVCs with a biventricular pacemaker, one of the arguments you could make is by having some electrical contribution to the intrinsic complex, you're getting at least a little bit more efficient uh, pump to the uh, to the QRS complex, a little more electrically um, efficiency. Because obviously, whenever we're programming a BIV, we're trying to get the most narrow QRS possible. And there's some degree of QRS na narrowing <clears throat> when you pace into a complex. Um, so that is one advantage of it. Another is if you have a patient with occasional noise, that's not that bad. Let me go back here, sorry. If you have a patient who has occasional noise, it may be advantageous to um, pace into, say this is noise here, it may just try to pace. Um, just in case, if this is noise, we go ahead and polarize the heart. And if it's not noise, then, and it's a true yeah. event, you just kind of fuse with it. So it's used as like a safety pace, and it's used as increasing your bi-V pacing. Oh, no, it looks like clean here. Sometimes you say they come. Uh, 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 here, I'm going to see the participants. Because we are in the corner. Okay, sorry, I had to take care of something. Okay, there we go. Um, Elvis, did that answer your question? Yes, it does, it does. Perfect, you don't see VVT Thank much. You. Uh, the only uh, time yeah, that I, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, the only I'm time you see any words, so that's why I was wondering uh, if it's still uh, clinically relevant. Uh, I think sometimes it just makes physicians feel better when they have a bi-V, and generally you want to have greater than eighty-six percent pacing percentage, like bi-V pacing percentage, to get any kind of like benefit. You know, generally you want greater than 90 to 95 percent. So if they have a lot of AFib with RVR, you see some physicians turn on VVT or DDT um, to try to at least get something where they feel like maybe they're assisting the patient and the bi-V isn't just essentially a paperweight while they have those high ventricular rates. So you won't see it much. If you ever see it and you ask and you're wondering what's going on, just you know, reach out and we can uh, talk through it. So um, AOO, we talked about VOO. AOO is the same thing. It's just in the atrium. Uh, we kind of talked on this last week, I believe, but um, 
there we we tend not to see atrial based only devices it was a thing in europe for a while um, the east coast did it for a while the advantage of this being you may reduce the instance um say if a patient only needs atrial support you may reduce let me okay i'm trying to mute some people here okay we're good um <clears throat> the only advantage of atrial only device um Maybe if they just have some degree of like sinus Brady or six sinus syndrome, um, <clears throat> and they still have, um, they, they can get support without it worrying about like occlusion. It's a simpler device. It's cheaper. Um, down the road, you stick a bunch of leads in there and they're more likely to develop occlusion and get SVC syndrome, or it could be harder to extract if they get infection. So um, the argument can be made. It's cheaper and it's easier just to put it an atrial only lead. Um, one big disadvantage of that though, is you don't know what's going on with the uh, ventricles at all. So if the patient develops some sort of AV nodal issues, we'd have no clue. And we could be pacing them all day long in the atrium and have, they could not be perfusing to their heart at all. Um, so are perfusing to their body at all. So that, that is a big disadvantage of atrial only devices. You'll tend not to see most of these. Um, you may see like a device that had ventricular lead problems and they don't need ventricular support. They had a dual chamber device. You may see them set AAI, uh, which we'll get to later. But just for your own knowledge, if you come across this, AOO, um, as, as Elvis said earlier, you have a pacing in the atrium. Um, you don't sense in the ventricle. You don't respond to anything because, or in the atrium either, sorry. You don't respond to anything because there's nothing there uh, to respond to. So in here, we have our same thing, 1,000 millisecond timing, waits 1,000 milliseconds, paces again, waits 1,000 milliseconds, paces again. Patient has a atrial-only device. They have some sort of sinus bradycardia and they're going in for um, shoulder surgery or what have you. You may set them AOO just to make sure that they have that, um, that support. Um, in this case, it doesn't matter whether or not it, anything occurs in the atrium. This is an intrinsic P wave. Device doesn't care. It's still gonna pace at this time. AOO is much less risky than VOO because pacing into a vulnerable period in the atrium could put them into AFib. So sure, they could have AFib with RVR that could eventually degrade into something in the ventricle, but it's not like you're going to put them into VT or VF on accident with one pace. So just things to keep in mind. It's not as crucial um, to worry about atrial devices, atrial only devices. AI here, that's going to be... Um, you know, pacing the atrium only, sensing in the atrium, and inhibiting only. You could technically have AAT. Um, I assume, uh, Elvis, I've never seen one, but uh, it's technically doable. Um, <clears throat> in this case, the device is sensed an event in the atrium. It resets a timer, 1,000 milliseconds. Atrial event occurs, so it resets a timer, waits 1,000 milliseconds. No atrial event occurs, so it paces. You see depolarization here. Um, and you can tell that we probably captured the atrium because you have this negative deflection on your P wave. Uh, waits a thousand milliseconds, paces again. Now, in this case, we probably have some degree of fusion. You can see this biphasicness to the um, <clears throat> P wave, which indicates that we probably contributed to it. So this would be like an example of atrial fusion. Um, you tend not to even see anything at all. It would either just not capture or we would capture, but. 1,000 milliseconds pace capture, waits, something occurs, it resets the timer from there, 1,000 milliseconds, something occurs. So <clears throat> one thing you may see with these kind of devices, AAI, v VVI, um, a nurse on the floor, whoever you're talking to could come in and say, hey, you know, this device is set VVI 60, but the patient's going 80 beats a minute. How do we slow their heart rate down? probably it's their intrinsic heart rate. And we can't do anything about that. And I don't know how many times a day that I end up, well, not a day, but a month I end up explaining to somebody on the floor that, you know, I can't slow their heart rate down with a pacemaker. If the pacemaker is pacing too fast, that's something we need to address. But if it's their intrinsic, we don't have any control over that. And that's something you should probably control with medications or let the patient do their own thing. So, um, but yeah, that's AI, pretty straightforward. Here's kind of a weird one. And we kind of talked on this last week, but we'll go over it again. VDD. <clears throat> so um, you have a ventricular-based pacing. You have sensing in both the atrium 
and the ventricle, and you have responding to that either with your ability to trigger or um, you're going to have, it's essentially trigger or inhibit. So you can either, if something occurs in the ventricle, it will withhold the ventricular pace. If something occurs in the atrium, it could trigger the device to go ahead and track that, um, which is called atrial tracking, uh, which is, once again, this is not a common form. You tend to see DDD is the manifestation of this. But um, if we have one of these leads here, sometimes you'll see a VDD lead, which actually has a ventricular, we have a little bipole here, and then it will actually have an atrial uh, bipole as well that has the ability to sense intrinsic atrial activity. So you cannot actually pace, you can't control the atrial activity, but you can follow what's going on in the atrium. Um, Elvis, I'm gonna pick on you again. Do you have a, do you know a reason why we do this over having an atrial lead? Uh, I'm not sure of the reason, but I believe it's likely they believe that the, the sinus node is fine. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure of the reason why, but I just believe perhaps they have that assumption that the spinal node is fine. There's no need of putting an atrial lead. So just yep. go ahead with the single no, that's, that's That's dead on, exactly. So they're, they have a functioning sinus. Um, they don't have a degree of like chronotropic incompetence. Sorry, it ran away from me here. Um, <clears throat> they have a functioning sinus. They don't have like chronotropic incompetence or sick sinus or anything like that where we need to control what's happening in the atrium. We know their atrium is working fine. We're more worried about their AV node right here. So in order to kind of circumvent this broken AV junction, we have created a new pathway. Um, and that's with our pace right here. So <clears throat> yeah, an advantage of one of those leads, and I don't use those, Abbott doesn't make those, but um, there are companies who do make them. Um, the an advantage of this is you don't have to worry about occlusion as much because you're only putting one lead. Um, it's more simple because you're only having to put one lead and either stick once or you don't have to use like a, we'll go through implant procedure some other date, but it's just, it's simpler to put it in. Um, so you will see these occasionally, but probably not super common. I only know one physician who really uses them up here in Boston, didn't really know anyone in St. Louis who used them all, but um, this is something you may see. Another thing is you can actually program a device with two leads to VDD as well. Um, the reason being for that would be, uh, I don't know, there's really not a good reason to do that, but you might as well just do DDD in most cases. Um, but yeah, it, it may occur. So if you ever come across it, that's what it's for. Um, just, a, just a question there, AJ. Um, I get given a load of leads and I've never ever seen a lead that does that. Is, is it got a special name, that lead or? Or is it a very special device you need to use if it can sense only in the atrium and pace in the ventricle? So it won't need a special device because uh, the lead actually, um, it looks like kind of like the DF1s or the old, uh, you know, where it kind of have this, this yoke where it bifurcates. So it actually has a ventricular plug and it has an atrial plug to the lead itself. Yeah, so um, it's got two plugs on it. So yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it, I've only ever heard it called like a VDD lead. So it, I know it has a model number, but I don't know. It, so, yeah, so, never seen um, it. Yeah. yeah. So, so, pass lead. so in the UK, sorry, um, sorry, AJ, can I, so Medtronic, Medtronic, um, call it single pass lead, single pass. It has been, it's been, um, but it's not, it's not something that a lot of people tend to do because it has a habit of falling, falling out, as in um, normally when it detects the P wave, it keeps like the P wave sensing, keeps going down, the value keeps going down because it's dangling in the atrium. Whereas when you have your, your normal active fixation or passive fixation, that's actually in a fixed position. So um, v single pass lead or VDD leads have a habit of displacing, so eventually they tend to program them to VVI, um, you know, pacing, usually when somebody's really old and, mm. and a single like chamber pacing will be adequate enough for, you know, um, their circulation, cardiac output circulation to, to you know, um, for them to get about and things. But yeah, Medtronic called a single pass lead. Um, 
I've sent one to Dr. Daffy's got one actually. He, he should have one. Um, sorry, EJ, go on, sorry. No, that's, that's great. Um, so Dr. Daffy, if you haven't used it yet and you'd like to use it for a patient, um, I would think you'd want to maybe, for example, a, a small patient where you're more worried about either screwing in an active fe um, helix or you're more worried about like forward pressure by putting in a passive fixed lead. You may consider this. Um, I would assume that's what I would think clinically is the advantages is you don't have to worry about um, an atrial perf risk. Um, and then other advantages is just, you know, if you're worried about them becoming occluded later in life or developing SVC syndrome, it's it's one less lead to take up any space. So I think it definitely has its advantages. I think that having just one electrode in the atrium is not ideal. If down the road they ever created one that had like, you know, you have your ventricular and then you had like a couple different atrial electrodes, kind of like what we see with an IS-4. Um, you yeah, know, that'd be nice. But I think that honestly, we're seeing uh, in the industry leaded devices going by the wayside within the next decade or two. Um, and I think there's still going to be, you know, a future for them. But I think that companies are investing more in leadless technology. So we're going to see less innovation. I could be wrong. Don't get me wrong. I don't know what all the other companies are doing, but um, yeah, it, it does have its advantages. We just don't personally make one. So I really can't speak to them all um, because I haven't read the talk tracks on it. So um, yeah, thank you very much, AG. I, uh, what you said, yeah, we will use it when the need arises. Perfect. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I, I would consult your mm. uh, Julius or your Medtronic representative for that one on that. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I you sent you an this I sent you an EKG. Uh -huh. uh, if you can look at it, this history is uh, the patient had uh, this intermittent um, uh, intermittent AV block, uh, a 12 degree hair block. So we put a dual chamber pacemaker for the patient. So after mm -hmm. that, we sent we sent him back to the referring cardiology and okay. um and uh, the cardiology saw the patient one day and um on the follow up and i asked him to uh, to do an ekg mm -hmm. so the ekg did was forwarded to me that was uh, two days ago uh, okay. can you just can you look at it and comment on it based on what we should do uh, what type of programming we should do for this uh, patient I also send it to Julius. Is that so? It's it's not a very good ECG though, Doctor Rafi. Sorry, <laughs> you can't really. You can only see the chest leads. There, there are no like you can't see any limb leads and, and that. So, uh, but I'll look at it properly. I'll look at it properly. Okay. So yeah, as well, we go on in the lecture, yeah. we can comment on it. Just zoom it. If you zoom it, it will be. Yeah, but why yes. didn't you should, for mm. a twelve lead ECG? You should be able to see all the leads, all the leads. I agree with you. Leads. But you can agree with you. see about three or four. Um, you know, so it's not it's not really a good one to I come agree from. with you. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Anyway, you can let me see if I can get this up here really quick. Um, so looking at this one right now, I mean, from a 12 lead interpretation, yeah, it's not the most uh beneficial. Um but looking at it just from a pacer perspective, I mean, we're not really needing to pace. They have a they have a steady PR here. Why don't we do this really quick? Two seconds here. Sorry to get sidetracked, but I think we have a little bit of time. So can everyone see this right here? Still? Yes, we can see it. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I thought I ended the, the conversation for a second. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is the twelve liter you're talking yeah, about. EKG. Yeah, I mean, we have we have p we have a PR interval. I don't know if I can zoom in any more than I already am, but mm. let's see. Oh, we can. Okay, so we have a good PR interval. We don't have a long conduction timing. We have a narrow QRS, um, mm. so there's really no indication for any kind of CRT or anything like that. Um, mm. So, I mean, from a pacing CRM perspective, I, there's no evidence um, that we need to be pacing most of the time. So these are the cases where we would have longer AV delays or allow this intrinsic conduction to come across. Um, 
that would be the the ideal for this candidate is only pace when we need to pace in general yeah. in the ventricle can contribute to heart failure um so pacing greater than what is it 40 50 percent of the time um that's actually an alert in many devices because um that you can toggle on and off the reason being let me bring this back just so i don't get too sidetracked here the reason being um you know, you can eventually contribute to their heart failure symptoms, and then we do end up having to put a CRT in them. So in this case, they have intermittent issues. They have their SA node, AV node, his bundle, and then conduction system to the ventricles. And this all seems to be functioning fine right now. This part seems to be functioning fine right now. So we do have, like you said, uh, that you put a dual chamber device in, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, so say this is our IVC, SVC, SVC, IVC. We have our dual chamber device. I probably should have used different colors here. We are accurately sensing based on that EKG what's happening in the ventricle and what's happening in the atrium and withholding that pacing. So when we talked about our dual chamber modes later, we can, uh, we'll hit on this. Um, but <clears throat> we talk about our dual chamber modes later. The device is seeing what's occurring in the atrium, so it's not pacing. It's seeing what's occurring in the ventricle, so it's not pacing. It's resetting its timer, and it's waiting to see if something occurs in the atrium. If it does, it, if nothing happens, it'll pace. And if nothing happens in the ventricle, it'll pace, which is your, what you're seeing displayed here. We'll go into deeper you know, details with that. Um, but in general, what we're trying to do in these cases is I would say you'd want to extend your ventricular pace as long as possible to let this intrinsic event occur. So if this conduction is going to occur, we give it as much time as possible. So we're not pacing this patient needlessly. Does that all make sense? Yes, correct. Perfect. Um, so I can, we'll keep moving and then we'll, we get to DDD. I'll kind of talk into this in more detail if that works. Um, so we have DOO here. <clears throat> so this is your first of your true dual chamber modes. Once again, pace in the, in the ventricle. We don't do anything as far as sensing or responding to sensing in the ventricle or the atrium. Um, we obviously we pace in both the ventricle and the atrium. So in this case, we're set, looks like 60 beats a minute. So our atrial timer is right here. Our ventricular timer is right here. I'll mark it negatively so we can kind of see the difference here. So our atrial timer starts, it waits a thousand milliseconds for something to occur, and then it'll pace. At the same time, when the atrial timer starts, this starts what's called your AV delay, or the delay that the device waits to pace what's happening, or to pace in the ventricle based on either a sensed event in the atrium, or a paced event in the atrium. So our paced AV delay looks like around 200 milliseconds. The device waits 200 milliseconds, nothing occurs, so it ventricular paces. This starts your ventricular timer over. Okay, so the ventricular timer goes, um, now once again, we're set DOO. So the device doesn't care that this atrial event occurs. It doesn't care that this ventricular event occurs. It just paces no matter what. This resets the atrial timer. It waits 1,000 milliseconds, paces again, resets the ventricular timer, waits 1,000 milliseconds, paces again. Um, another re same thing as VOO. DOO, you use um, an example, say the patient's going into surgery, or we know that the patient has issues with um, you know, noise and we're trying to bridge them to a gen change or revision um, or anything like that. It's just a way to, to kind of... Uh, as a band-aid. So this is DOO. It's the most simple dual chain, like proper dual chamber mode. Does that make sense for everybody? Yes, sir. Perfect. DDI. Okay. So DDI is very similar oh, to VVI. Sorry, Mr. Except, Andrew. Yeah, go on. Uh, for the DOO, would it be mm -hmm. nice to as well um, shorten the um, AV interval? So as mm -hmm. uh, well reduce the competitive pacing. Just That's, to be on the safe side. Would yes. Nice? Um, I would agree with you on that. I, so in as far as pacing into vulnerable period, that's a really good point. Um, same as you said for VOO, DOO, I would typically go like 
at least uh, that's an eight, right? That kind of looks like an eight, at least 80 to maybe a hundred beats a minute DOO. Um, if you ever do MRIs, DOO is a common rate. Uh, they're going for surgery, anything like that. And as you said, it's to beat out any kind of intrinsic activity, whether it be conducted or whether it be PVCs. Um, you can shorten AV delays. I will tell you, if you capture in the atrium, you're most likely not going to pace into a T wave. In this case, we pace into a T wave, but that wasn't an atrial capture issue. This was an issue of we're not going fast enough in general. So if our ventricular timing was set to be faster, we probably would have paced here no matter what, right? Um, so I think that's a good point. You don't want to have like a 400 millisecond AV delay. Say you have a patient who is typically programmed um, in Dr. Daffe's example about um, we're trying to let them conduct intrinsically. So they have like an AV delay of instead of 200, we have an AV delay of like 350 milliseconds or something like that, right? Um, that, if we had waited that long, could have resulted in us pacing longer into um, vulnerable periods of the tissue. So if they have very long AV delays, I would recommend shortening them. If they're 180, 150, something like that, it's not a huge deal. You can leave them shorter than that. But if they're above 200, I, I completely agree with you, shorten them up a little bit. Um, and those are the kind of things where, you know, I, I think it's important when you're dealing with pacemakers, um, you don't always have a template of what to do. It's more of understanding generally what the device is going to do, its actions, and then planning accordingly. So I think sometimes um, people who are inexperienced programming devices can put patients into dangerous situations because they're trying to fit this mold that doesn't necessarily fit the specific patient. So you have to tailor programming to the patient, to the circumstance, um, and to existing programming. So definitely agree with you here. It was 350, shorten the AV delay to at least 200. Um, you can even go shorter, but that would be my recommendation. And then obviously go at a faster rate for DOO. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for the man. thanks for the addition. That was that's really helpful. Um, <clears throat> so DDI, we have dual chamber. We have the ability to sense in both chambers, atrium and ventricle, and we inhibit our actions based upon what is sensed. So that means if something occurs within one of those chambers, it will inhibit the pacing. So in this case, we have our same 60 beats a minute, nice and easy, 1,000 milliseconds. The device paced in the atrium. We see a negative P wave, pretty good indicator that we probably captured there. It sets the timer, waits 1,000 milliseconds, and then it's going to pace. If nothing occurs, same thing in the ventricle. It waits its programmed AV delay, which in this case is around 200 milliseconds. Nothing occurs in the ventricle, so it paces. So DDI is a ventricular-based timing mode, which means it doesn't really follow what the atrium is doing, but the atrial timing follows what the ventricle is doing. Um, the reason this kind of matters is um, your A to A timing is not always going to be 1,000 milliseconds, if a ventricular event comes earlier, your atrial timing is actually the um, V timing minus the AV delay. So in this case, your actual atrial timing is not based on this 1,000 millisecond clock. It's actually based on the ventricular clock minus 200 milliseconds. So our ventricular paced event occurs And it has then subtracted 200 milliseconds from what your ventricular base timing was, which is 1,000 milliseconds. It subtracts 200. I'm left-handed and I'm using my right hand. So if this looks terrible, that's why. Subtracts 200. So your actual A to A timing is based on your V to A timing of 800 milliseconds after the ventricular event occurs. Why does this matter? Well, in this case, if an intrinsic event came across, let's see if we have one here. If an intrinsic event came across at 150 milliseconds instead of 200, then you would actually be shaving 50 milliseconds off of your atrial timing, right? Because this would be, instead of 1,000 milliseconds, this would be 800 milliseconds after the ventricular event occurred. So the ventricular event occurs here, it waits 800 milliseconds 
and then at atrial paces. And that means your total ventricular timing is 900 and, or sorry, your total atrial timing is 950 milliseconds. And everyone's like, why does this matter? I don't know, because you'll see weird, it, it won't make as much sense if you don't know what's, what's occurring. So just remember that DDI is a, is a modified ventricular based timing. Um, it's basically VVI adding atrial activity as well. Uh, Elvis, this is going to matter to you when you take the test because they're going to ask you, why did this atrial pace um, occur earlier than 1000 milliseconds? Why did it occur at 950? When you take the IBHRE, that's why, because it's ventricular based timing. Um, I know that is kind of weird and complicated. So if anyone has any questions, let me know. Okay, perfect. So yeah, AJ. Yes, sir. AJ, sir. Yeah, you know, in um, in Nigeria or in the sub-Saharan Africa, the mm -hmm. commonest reason for pacing is um, is AV uh, is uh, AV this block. That is the commonest. Okay. AV blocks are the commonest, and among the AV blocks, um, complete. Um, a third degree AV block is the commonest among them. So uh, most time you will see a patient with AV block. Mm -hmm. um, among, let's say if you have 20 patients for pacemaker, mm -hmm. you will notice that uh, 19 or 18 of them will have AV block. Then even among the 18 that will have AV block, they mm -hmm. may there may among them there may be also uh, one or two among them that will have a uh, cis uh, that will have um, SA nodal disease. So in this case, when you put this together, what do you recommend? Because most of our um, age for pacing here usually towards the elderly and in the elderly. Mm -hmm. Most pacing here are done with people sixty. 70, 80, 90, especially around 70. That is the clocking time for mm -hmm. most of the patient. You can see some, a uh, very few at 40, 50, but when you, when, when you, most of them, if you look at them, the age range is within that, within that uh, 60, 70, 70, 70. So what do you recommend? What mode do you recommend most time to address because if you review the patient before, uh, before the procedure, mm -hmm. you will decide which uh, pacing mode you are going to give based on the intrinsic activity of that patient. Mm -hmm. What you saw on the EKG and what you uh, we think is the intrinsic activity, the native activity of that patient. Mm -hmm. So and now for people with AV block, because that is the commonest one we see here. What's, what do you recommend commonly around here? Then also another set of people we also see, uh, which is uh, we see occasionally are those with, uh, with uh, permanent AF uh -huh. and who had a slow ventricular response. Mm -hmm. And usually this group of people are more of uh, 80, 80 something years. S uh, permanent AF, that has a slow ventricular response from uh, probably a complete heart block or um, a, a mobi type two or the uh, or a high grade AV block. Okay. So yeah. what do you recommend in combining? So you're getting ahead of me here. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I, so in general, and we'll we'll go over this. And I, I realize how late it is all of a sudden. So I, I'll try to get through this a little quicker, but. Um, in general, you want to go for the more, um, the most complex that you can get away with. So uh, I think it says, puts a little more succinctly in the slides to follow. But whenever you're programming, you want to go with the best opportunity to have AV synchrony um, and the best opportunity to kind of follow the intrinsic activity of their heart. So what their heart would do normally. Um, so we want to reduce RV pacing, if at all possible, because that can contribute to heart failure. However, if everyone's an AV block, we're going to have to pace the ventricle, 
right? Yeah, yeah. To increase atrial synchrony when possible, you want to increase um, atrial kick as well. So if we know the patient has complete heart block, we don't need to have long AV delays because we're going to pace them either way in the ventricle. We should not be waiting for their intrinsic event to occur. And this is kind of an issue with DDI, right? So DDI is paying attention to what's happening in both, and it's trying to maintain atrial synchrony as long as the rate is below the base rate. So if your base rate is 60, there you're always going to have atrial synchrony, right? Nothing is occurring intrinsically. So we pace, we wait, we pace. So the atrial activity occurs, we wait the proper amount of time. If this was a heart, you end up having the atria squeeze, which then expands the heart and the, expands the ventricles, which allows it to have a better squeeze um, through the, uh, you know, through the outflow tracks. Um, <clears throat> so and I'll go over this a little bit later, but in general, um, a DDI device is fine for patients who are below the base rate because you end up having optimal timing between the atria and the ventricle, allowing it to have that atrial kit, kick, it expands the ventricle, it squeezes and pumps the blood out. You are allowing for intrinsic activity that's occurring in the ventricle if it does occur. Um, <clears throat> and you're making sure that you're not dropping any kind of beats here at all. The problem with DDI is if the patient's rate increases, you end up having loss of atrial synchrony. So in this case here, our timer starts in the atrium. It's once again, based off the ventricle, but it starts in the atrium An atrial event occurs, and then it waits its AV delay and paces the ventricle. Starts again, an atrial event occurs, so it doesn't pace the atrium. It waits its AV delay and or your V-based timing in this case, right? So it's still waiting a thousand milliseconds. So you're starting to see this prolongation of your PR interval. And we're seeing this occur here where it gets worse and worse until eventually um, their intrinsic activity comes across. So we're still waiting our 1,000 milliseconds. We don't care what the atrium is doing. We're not speeding up our ventricular timing. And in this patient right here, we're good, right? We're, we're still making sure their heart is beating. But is this optimized for this specific patient? I would argue no. I would say this is not the proper programming for this patient because we're losing this AV synchrony which means that the patient is not getting that atrial kick in the later events. And or the argument can be made, we're not optimized because this patient may have intrinsic conduction. So we're RV pacing them greater than 50% of the time, which is also not ideal, right? We don't want to pace them all the time. We could pace them in heart failure in 40% of those patients. So um, I, I think that that's a really good point that you brought up is that how do we decide what's best for this patient? And I think you kind of just have to have all of those factors in your head when you're optimizing a patient. Is it, do they have intrinsic conduction? Am I trying to avoid, um, am I trying to avoid RV pacing? Am I trying to maintain any kind of atrial synchrony? Um, all those things should play a factor. If you're waiting 450 milliseconds for this intrinsic QRS to come across, if we're waiting all day and then it comes across, there is no more atrial kick at all. Like the atrium has squeezed and then the blood has just leaked its way back to the atrium through the, through the valves. So that is an argument for why we don't need to wait all day to ventricular pace. Some argument, some people I've heard, and once again, if you want to read the studies on it yourself, I'm not a doctor, but some, some I've worked with electrophysiologists will argue that if you're waiting 450 milliseconds, you're doing a disservice to your patient by waiting that long, because they're losing that atrial synchrony. They're losing 30% of their output. So you kind of just have to weigh all those factors with optimize the um, So you'd asked about like what mode to choose. This is gonna be your gold standard mode, your DDD mode. Um, and this means you pace in the ventricle, you sense in the ventricle, and you respond to sensing a ventricle either by triggering or AV tracking or inhibiting with holding a pace because something occurred intrinsically. So in this DDD mode, you have an atrial event occurred. Now this is going to be an atrial based timing. An atrial event occurs, it sets an AV delay. So it waits, it's 200 milliseconds, but before those 200 milliseconds come across, a ventricular event occurs. This resets the timer. It waits a thousand milliseconds. An atrial event does not occur. So it A paces here. 
AP, if anyone was wondering. It waits 200 milliseconds for this to occur. A ventricular um, conduction does occur before the 200 millisecond timer comes out. So it resets the ventricular base timing. So we continue on here. It waits 1,000 milliseconds pace, waits 1,000 milliseconds, nothing occurs, and it paces. So this is going to be your most advantageous for patients because when the atrium speeds up, we follow what the atrium is doing, right? So we maintain that atrial synchrony above the base rate of 60 BPM. That means if a patient is conduct or going 80 beats a minute in the atrium, we can then follow that and make sure we're pacing accordingly. Moreover, a lot of different companies have different algorithms. We have VIP in Abbott. They have MVP in Medtronic. I'm sure Boston has something, but I have no idea what it's called. And then Biotronic, we don't really see much of those. But these are different algorithms to add additional time when the patient is conducting. So it allows us to track what's happening in the atrium. It allows us to wait a little bit extra time for an intrinsic to come across and maintain this synchrony. But if nothing came across here, we would pace. There wouldn't be a T wave right here, obviously. This would be a new complex. Uh, <clears throat> And what and that allows us to do, to do is maintain our AV synchrony. It also allows us to uh, regulate the heart rate based upon their metabolic needs of the patient. So this is your gold standard and DDD is what you're typically going to see the most. But as you said, you have these patients with complete heart block, they're not going to be conducting much. So we are going to be tracking the atrium, but we'll probably keep our AV delays short if we know they're not going to be conducting. I'll keep it at 200 milliseconds. I'll keep it at 180 milliseconds. Um, and then I'm just going to pace no matter what, because we know there's nothing intrinsic going to be breaking across, but we still want to maintain that atrial synchrony and also regulate the heart rate based upon demand. If the patient's exercising, their heart rate's going to go up and we want the device to follow that. We don't want to go pace them at 60 beats a minute all the time. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Probably. It's clear. As okay. if somebody has a question, it's clear. Okay. What's the question? I can't read the chat. Let's see if I can read no. it. I said this clip on my side. Elvis, you have a question? Uh, okay. So regards uh, um, the intermittent uh, AV block, yeah. would you think uh, shortening the AV interval, you, would you think that would help at all? Would, would we want to just see how much of uh, intrinsic activity would go in and then just back up the, the policy. Yeah, so intermittent AV block, I would I would set, um, so if I had an, an, an Avid device, right? I would set a VIP on, right? Which in VIP, the way it does is it, it searches for intrinsic activity and then it adds an extra programmable, but I usually do 200 milliseconds addition, right? So if their AV delay, is 200 milliseconds already. VIP is adding 200 milliseconds to that to be 400. Now this searches, I usually program it every 30 seconds, right? So they have intermittent AV block. <clears throat> As you pointed out, most of the time, it's going to be pacing at 200 milliseconds, atrial pace, ventricular pace, atrial pace, ventricular pace. And then every 30 seconds or so, it's going to extend the AV delay to 400 milliseconds and if nothing occurs, it'll ventricular pace again. And it'll do that three times. Once again, this is all programmable, but we'll do three, three times, 400 milliseconds. And then if that if nothing occurs, it always paces, and then it reshortens the AV delay to be short again. So that means that most of the time you have this AV synchrony, you get that extra 20 to 30% of your cardiac output. Um, and then if they are conducting, say an intrinsic event did occur right here, it would then leave the AV delays at 400 milliseconds. So that means at times when they are conducting, we're allowing them to break through. So we reduce our RV pacing. We're still following the atrium and we're shortening AV delays um, the rest of the time when they are conducting. So it's kind of, you're getting the, the best of both worlds. We're reducing RV pacing percentage, but we're also um, reducing the amount of, uh, are increasing the amount of atrial kick by allowing intrinsic conduction and not waiting, but not waiting too long. Does that make sense? 
I've got a little question. Yeah, Just yeah. Is, is is that MVP mode available on the sort of third generation Medtronic spheres, or is this like a brand new thing? So, because obviously in Nigeria mostly they've just got these spheres and third gens. Does Julius know or anyone know? Yeah, it's to not MVP made ventricular pacing, which which is an um, um, AV node algorithm. Um, mm. So that um, it is on Azure's. Um, it is on Azure's. It's also on Spheres, actually. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's quite on on Medtronic. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so you can have yeah. So basically, all it means, I think I've spoken to Elvis. So you basically, all it is is AAI to DDD. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it sort of paces the atrium um, if they are chronotropically incompetent, and then um, and just like um, AJ was saying. It will basically um, sense the AV node, just like VIP, um, and and within within a few cycles, it will sense the AV node extender, um, and if it finds any intrinsic, um, that's intrinsic, then you just leave it alone and continue to support the atrium. So if the patient goes into complete heart block, if the AV node is stretched out and with complete heart block, then it will just go into DDD mode, like AJ was saying. So mm -hmm. Medtronic have an AAI to DDD. Biotronic is DDD ADI. I was, I was explaining to um, Elvis the other day. Um, and Boston call, um, call it's, it's called Rhythm IQ. Rhythm IQ does what VIP does and MVP does. But Medtronic, the older ones do not have it. Um, so Azure definitely has it. And Sfera also has AAI to DDD. So mo actually, most of Medtronic nowadays actually have got that mode, uh, AAI the, to DDD mode. So, so Julius, Julius is 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 not in uh, Sfera. No, you, you can have um, you can have AAI to DDD, which does pretty much. Fair. Sorry, it's you can have, no, you can have AAI to DDD, which does the same thing, intermittent thing. So yes. um, you, can, you can use, you can not uh, manage ventricular pacing. If you're talking about man manage ventricular pacing to trigger that, to put that on, AAI and DDD will be able to, well, does exactly what MVP does. So yes, if somebody right. has- but It's not on Spera. That yeah. Mode yeah, but it, on Spera. yeah. In you know, some of the older devices, they don't have it. So Medtronic in some of the older devices that don't have the AAI to DDD mode switch, they, Medtronic has a thing called Search AV. Uh, it's very similar to Medtronic's VIP, um, yeah. Yeah. Abbott's VIP, sorry. So yeah. theirs is called Search AV. So any any devices you guys are getting out in Africa that doesn't have the AAI DDD mode switch, yeah. you will have to look for something called Search yeah. AV. Yeah. And it's very similar. You have a programmed yeah. AV delay, and then you add a Search AV of, say, like AJ said, 200 milliseconds. Yeah. It will extend that out. If you get intrinsic rhythm rate, the AV delay will stay at 400 milliseconds. As soon as you pace at 400 milliseconds, the AV delay will shorten back into that programmed event. And then after a certain amount of cycles, it will then extend out again. And that process will just keep continuing and continuing throughout. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jared. Pleasure, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the spira we get in Nigeria has a search AV um, feature. Yeah but does yeah. not have the MVP or the AI mode. Yeah, yeah but the point is, Elvis, you can AI DDD does what 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 you want. If it's an intermittent complete heart block, you, you can certainly put it that. Um, and it will it will it will search the AV you know, over a few cycles. And if it goes into complete heart block, it will switch to DDD on its own. So all all the Medtronics have have got that, the new ones have that. But yeah, yeah, the uh, old one, uh, yeah, the old yeah. ones which they send to us here, uh, Sensha and uh, yeah, Sarah. Yeah, as I said, Sensha doesn't have yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. don't have it. Uh, they even the Sarah they sent to us in Africa here. They don't have it. W what will happen is that we will search it. Uh, um, that we see Dr. Daffy, with Sarah and Dr. Daffy, the Sarahs have got AI. Remember, we we did that recently. No, they don't. They, they don't yeah. have it, sir. They don't have AI uh, mode. They the don't have AI to DDD. Don't they don't. They it's have a, uh, They don't have AI to DDD. They don't have it separate, bro. So which they one did we do recently? That was AI to DDD on that on Aspera. That's an Azure. 
That is as no, no, sir. But we've done, but we've not done as Ferra that has, has got that, no? No, no, no sir. Asfera only has a You know, I've asked you the question people. several times that why is it that we don't have this particular um advantage in Sphera? We the 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 questions could not uh, we I wasn't really satisfied with all the answer because they don't have it. So what we have in Sphera, I will post something. I think I have some images too. I posted something at a point in time to Edda. Um, when I was, uh, uh, Dr. Joe wanted me to uh, be part of a, 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 a co-founder mission, I posted yeah. something on that group at a point in time, telling us that, look, this fera we have here has a lot of uh, yeah, limitations. Yeah, yeah, you did. Yeah, you I did. posted something yeah. of that nature at that time. Yeah, um, yeah sorry. We I don't will look for it and repost it. Yeah, we don't have spheres. We don't tend to do that here, actually, in, in my hospital, anyway. So that's why. Sorry, sorry, man. We just turned on the set AV future, and that's yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Let me see. Sorry, AJ. We just distracted. No, no, you're good. I uh, Medtronic is outside my wheelhouse, so I don't want to. Yeah. Yes, I'm in so here. So AJ is AJ is good that Doctor Donnie brought up this issue. Yeah. Because why he brought, because before now, it is now that we started seeing Azure, uh, uh, because Azure pacemakers are not sold in, sub uh, in Nigeria. Hmm. If I'm sure in sub saharan Africa, they are not sold there. The pacemaker we get uh, that is uh, from Medtronic, which is the uh, the only, uh, only pacing, but, uh, pacing company that, that span this region, especially in Nigeria, is... Uh, Sensha yeah, yeah. and Sphera. These are the two devices we get. And mm -hmm. this Sensha and Sphera, we don't have many of these, so, um, these soft uh, advantages that you have in Azure's and adapter and other um, uh, new devices. We don't, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. So it is the opening up for Pace for Life and um, the trial that is going on that is have, making us to have this advantage mm -hmm. of having all this sphere. As Elvis, we implanted that last patient, patient number nine. Elvis was shouting, that patient has an Azure that can treat AF. We don't have, if we are to use the old system, which we call new, they don't have all these, um, all these um, advantages, which we now get being a part of the trial and being part of Pace for Life. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's. That's a definite benefit. And I think that matters when you're choosing what device to use for what patient, right? Yes. Um, I think that a lot of times, you know, in the US, we just, we have access to the ones we need. So it, it's less of a conscious decision before a procedure. But here having these varied devices you have at your fingertips, I think you really need to think about what the patient indication is and what they need it for. And maybe don't give them a device that has all the benefits they don't necessarily, they're not going to use. Um, and save that for the patient who will use it. Same thing with that VDD lead. If we know we're going to pace in the atrium, then we're going to put an atrial lead in. Um, so yeah, the, I, I don't envy the added steps that you have for your decision-making process, but I think it's definitely something to keep in mind when you're selecting devices. Uh, in cases where you don't have VIP, where you don't have MVP or AI DDD, um, I think you just have to pay attention to see like how much are we pacing the ventricle. If we know the patient conducts at 350 milliseconds, um, those are the cases where you know you may allow for more time for them to conduct through, um, and just set them at a 375 millisecond delay. If you're going all the way to 450, you know you got to weigh that against are they getting that atrial kick. Um, if we know the patient doesn't conduct until 500 milliseconds, then we're probably just going to set them at shorter AV delays so they get that atrial kick and at least have some benefit there. So just things to keep in mind, these algorithms make it easier to do more of a one-size-fits-all programming versus you have to be a little more conscious about it and maybe update it based upon the patient um, situation. So the patient could have normal healthy conduction and degrade over the course of 10 years, and you may just extend that AV delay out when you see them to kind of compensate for that until it gets to the point where it's too long and then just shorten it up um, and consider them as a CRT candidate if you start to see um, degradation of their um, 
you know, heart failure symptoms or their cardiac output starts to go down. So, make sense? Sure. Yes, it does. Thank you. Cool. Really quick then, AIR, VVIR, DDDR, these are just incorporating the sensor driven rate. Um, people use different sensors. There is blood temperature sensors, which you'll see on, I think, older biotronic devices and the more, the newer uh, leadless devices that Abbott makes. Uh, there are piezoelectric sensors, which are like the pedometer sensors with traditional pacemakers that Abbott makes um, run off of. And they basically detect movement. And based upon that movement, they modulate the, uh, the rate on that. There are different distinct advantages and disadvantages. And Elvis, I can go into detail um, with you about the advantages of both. With you all, you're probably going to mostly see the piezoelectric sensors or something like that. I believe that's what Medtronic uses as well. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. But um, in general, you know, you're going to customize the sensor based upon patient needs. So, um, and if you ever need to optimize that, we can sit down and do a deeper talk on optimization of sensor based upon patients, whether or not they're very active or whether or not they need their heart rate to increase faster or slower. Um, those are things we can sit down and talk about at a later time. But the big things to remember here is that fourth setting in the NBG code is just sensor driven rate. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you have patients set like this and they're asking you on the floor, why is their heart rate going 90 and we're pacing? It's probably because the sensor detects movement or something along those lines. So, um, so mode selection, we kind of like, we've already talked about this quite a bit, but the big things we're looking at is what's the underlying rhythm <clears throat> for the patient? You know, what's their overall cardiac condition? Are we trying to decrease the amount of ventricular pacing? Are we going to see um, disease progression? So do we think that they're going to have longer um, more AV degradation. Do we need to leave a longer AV delay because we won't see this patient at follow-up, things like that? Um, do they not have conduction at all? Do we need to have short AV delays? Um, <clears throat> are we maintaining our AV synchrony so we get that 30% of the atrial kick? Um, and then obviously overall condition life expectancy. So what device are we putting in? Do we need to put in a dual chamber device in a patient who has AFib? Probably not. It's probably, you know, more expensive. It's more difficult. There's more risk involved in adding an extra lead. So if we know they're an AFib, VVI devices are generally fine. Um, you see this a lot. So single chamber devices. Um, so just considerations there. So why VVI? It's one lead, only one pacing spike to keep track of. It's really straightforward. It's pretty cheap to implant. But one of the big issues is loss of AV synchrony. So if they have a functional atrium, VVI device is probably not optimal. Unless it's one of those patients that you know they're just going to have an occasional drop in rate and we just need very, very um, intermittent pacing support, then we could do a VVI device. But you do run the risk of having pacemaker syndrome um, where you actually have blood, where you're pacing the ventricle and you have blood backflowing into the atrium due to loss of atrial synchrony. So you'll end up with people feeling like pulsations in their throat or they'll feel kind of like sick or not ideal. Um, that's a reason why we may want to avoid putting a VVI device in someone with a healthy atrium. Uh, dual chamber pacing. <clears throat> so you always have an atrial beat corresponding to a ventricular beat. Um, you'll allow for that atrial kick, which is 20, 30% of your cardiac output. Um, Frank Starling Law, Elvis, I'm sure you know this, but if not, study it because it'll come up. Uh, <clears throat> you want to mimic the healthy heart as much as possible. So everything we're trying to do is to act like a healthy human heart down to CRT. You know, we're trying to be as close as we can to the intrinsic conduction system because we haven't come up with a better uh, system yet than what, you know, we naturally occur. Um, and then obviously we all avoid pacemaker syndrome. Um what are the drawbacks? It's harder to put in. There's an extra lead. You know, there's more risk of occlusion. It's just, you know, it's it's things to consider. And then obviously, uh, dual chamber modes, we're talking DDI, DDD. It is more complicated. So for the people who are going to support this in the field, it's something to keep in mind. It's not necessarily going to be the easiest thing to regulate. So, um, <clears throat> we will get into dual chamber pacing on a different day because uh, Lord knows I've already talked long enough for y'all and you probably need a break. Uh, but the idea with dual chamber pacing, um, you know, just keep in mind, there's two cycles, there's two channels we're having to deal with. 
Um, and we'll go through all that. So if there are there any questions, I guess, before I hop off here. No relay from my side. Um, maybe other people have questions, but I don't have yet. Elvis, do you have? Because uh, it's good we ask all our questions so that we don't have issues when we encounter these devices. I think what's important to understand is, uh, especially Dr. Adapi there, is what he was saying is that given that yes. most people in, in sub-Sahara, given that most of their indication for pacing is complete heart block, mm -hmm. then really mm -hmm. the most basic form of pacemaker is going to be enough for these patients. Um, you're not going to need any of the fancy things. You're just really going to need something that is allowing you to going to program DDD at 50, 60 perhaps, and, and let them sit like that for eight to 10 years based on battery life, obviously. But um, and as AJ said, maybe keep your higher end devices on the shelf for those patients that maybe present with intermittent heart blocks or two to one blocks who don't need pacing all the time. So then you can then use those AAI DDD modes. And um, so, yeah, maybe if that makes Good. sense. Yes, sir. Thank you and very obviously, much. And given the other other population you, you face down there is your chronic AF patients with uh, with slow ventricular response. And again, just a very basic VVI pacemaker is suitable for these patients as well. Again, you don't need mm -hmm. anything too fancy. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Good. Absolutely. Then, the, sorry, this is a little digression. Uh, uh, Mr. Gerard, do you, uh, for a patient with, um, um, with, uh, biventricular heart failure that will require a biventricular pacing. Yep. Um, you, and it has a chronic, uh, sorry, permanent AF. Uh, do you support the issue of um, uh, not pacing the atrium? Because not all electrophysiology support that, but I, uh, I know many center in, uh, uh, in, um, <clears throat> In your side, may have may be supporting that by uh, taking out the uh, the atrium, uh, at, uh, putting a lead in the at, uh, in the atrium. And if that happened, what do you do? Because uh, these are patients uh, who had heart failure. We 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 had uh, when I came for update sponsored by Pace for Life uh, at uh, Northampton General Hospital. I saw uh, the things that are being done. They are very fantastic. So mm -hmm. also, I, I also copy that into my practice and that is also what I'm doing here. Uh, the one of our patient that we did for uh, biventricular pacing because he has a permanent AF, we didn't uh, put anything in the, uh, in the ROV, sorry, RO, uh, ROA. So, and, mm -hmm. We kept, when we were to, uh, to program, we noticed that if we program the base rate, uh, uh, base heart rate at, uh, at 60, we are not getting enough. I remember AJ was the one that did that programming because St. Jude, we, we used that day. So yeah. AJ that we called to do the programming. So um, we have to now move, uh, move the base rate to, I think around either 85 or 90, if I'm correct, AJ. Yes, yes, before we were able to get uh, a significant uh, this thing. But my fear when I was um, when I was agreeing with AJ that day, my fear was that this is a patient who has been in a chronic heart failure for long period of time. Why mm -hmm. am I giving this patient this high um, yeah. high heart rate? So that was my fear. Uh, but yeah. all the same, I also to uh, talk with. I also agree with AJ that. I'm going to step up the medication, but the problem of stepping up the medication is I need a, a broad pressure, a good broad pressure to do the stepping up of the medication. So these are some of the challenges that we face here because you want to use medication to, uh, uh, to reduce the effect of the AF, but you don't, and most of the medications that you use, they're also going to reduce your broad pressure for you. Either you are using a amiodarone or you are using mm. a beta blocker, they will reduce the blood pressure for you. So you don't have 
so a broad pressure that is already at the borderline, you don't want to further TT too, uh, too low so that you don't end up causing trouble for the patient. So these are yeah. some of the issues we face. So I don't know whether you have one or two suggestions to help us also yeah, to think through them. Look, um, I think in my experience, um, I think someone with chronic atrial fibrillation, I think an A-lead doesn't bring anything to the party. Um, I think you're better off just going in there, putting in your LV lead, your RV lead, and tapping off the um, atrial port. Um, because obviously, even even if you did put an atrial lead in, the device isn't going to use it. it all it's going to do is um, mode switch to DDI anyway, which would be then a non-tracking mode, or yeah, not going to program a VBI anyway. So really, your atrial lead's only going to give you really it's a bit of atrial information, which is going to tell you that they're in atrial fibrillation, which you already know anyway. So I don't think an atrial lead is, is worthwhile in these patients. Um, so personally, I would, we, we put in a, an RV and an LV lead and cap the atrial port with just a little pin port plug. Um, the second thing is, is with, again, it depends on the level of device that you have. A lot of the, a lot of obviously the more modern devices these days have a thing called uh, V sense response meaning that at the base rate of 60 or 70, if they're, at, if they're below that, then great, you'll be in five ventricular pace. But with AF, if you get a bit more fast conducted events, then uh, by turning on the ventricular sense response, it will then, uh, it will trigger a, an LV uh, pacing on top of the, R, um, the QRS, on top of the V sense. So it helps, helps you kind of up your by V trigger um, a little bit. It'll get, it'll make your pacing percentage look a bit better, but, there is still a lot of studies, well, a lot of research needs doing on how effective this truly is. Um, my opinion is it's not hugely effective. It's, it's good for making the numbers look good, but is it truly, is V-sense response truly going to be advantageous as, 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 a, as uh, compared to by B pacing? So there is a mode that, you know, in VBI, as I said, then you can have this V-sense response turned on, which I would usually commonly do. The other option, I guess, is, yeah, and as you mentioned, is you could up-titrate their medication, up-titrate their, up their beta blocker. But as you say, the, the consequence with that is then having to try and maintain a decent uh, cardiac output and blood pressure. So that's always quite a challenging one. Um, I'm not a doctor, so I, I can't really comment on with the medic, how, what, what drugs you should or shouldn't give. But, um, but that's certainly, you know, in practice that you see here is. And then on the fourth one for us, and again, we're, I'm not sure if you have the luxury, but for some of these patients, this particular group of patients is we would actually ablate the AV node. Now I know you may not have that. Um, that yes. That luxury. Yes. So, we don't uh, have that luxury here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fine. Very important. Uh, very important. So, yeah. Yes, so I think in this candidate of patients is it's just a matter of program and BBI turning on B sense response, trying to up titrate their beta blocker as much as you can um and seeing how you go with that okay uh, because thank I, you I very think, much yeah i hope uh, that helps and please add more mm. no, yes sir yeah those are great points and i think that elvis you kind of mentioned like vbt what is that um you're jared this v sense response is essentially like a vvt mode correct where you're just yeah, 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 yeah. You, you exactly exactly so yeah and, and kind of as we discussed i don't know if you caught that part of it but I agree with you. I think that some people like to feel good because it pads the numbers, but whether or not it's effective, who knows, but you probably have some degree of fusion. So you could argue it's helping, um, but uh, whether or not it's helping worth the battery offset or anything like that. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that those are all really good points. Um, what you could do, I don't know if you have access to ac echo, but you could assess, um, you know, cardiac output under pacing at a higher rate versus under um, their intrinsic. And if their intrinsic is really that terrible, then I think you're better off pacing at a higher rate, but I'm not a physician either. And you need to take those conversations with physicians, which I'm happy to connect you with. But I think that you can use additional, you know, clinical tools you may have um, in your, in your toolbox to, to assess those things and is higher rates of pacing better than allowing intrinsic conduction. Um, it depends on how efficient their heart is. If they're a kind of weak, indication for CRT, then pacing them all the time very fast may not necessarily be advantageous. So I would speak to one of our EPs that are happy to talk us through it.
Yeah, that would be good. So we want to we want to hear and learn from the horse's mouth. So if you can talk to one of your EP, please, uh, it would be great to, uh, to, to receive the wealth of knowledge from him, sir. Okay, sounds good. I will, uh, I'll run that by them and get their opinion on it. So yes, sir. Uh, all right, if there's not anything else to cover, I think that I've really overspoken uh, here. And I know that Julius, you have some stuff to cover. Do you all want to take like a five minute break and then hop back into it? Yes. So while we are proceeding for the break, um, uh, is it possible you can um, up, you can update the slides and share what you think would be safe to share with us so that people can have it at their tab, revising with it? Yeah. So I think I'm good to go ahead and share this. Um, I have a larger presentation as well. I, I mm -hmm. will get it to the group. Um, I'll try to get it to the group either after the call or as soon as I can, but we'll get Thank it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. So five minutes break, then we'll take um, um, Dr. Gilios as a copy. So thank you very much. I'm grateful. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks, thanks sir. That, that was really, thanks, really thank you. Thank that, was you. Excellent. that was really, really thank good. You. Oh, thank you. And you you could probably pause recording for the five minutes, maybe. Oh yeah, that's probably a good point, huh? Um, perfect. Uh, Julius, you have the helm. Let me pause the recording. Maybe oh, you have control, so you got to pause it. Looks like Zoom recording. Okay, we're good. All right, thank you, thank you. And no one on the recording has to know. We'll just act like we we'll leave this part. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Let's see. Um, are you still trying to give me all right yep, you got it there you're now host okay so share screen um okay Hi, me. Uh, okay yeah that's right okay okay can everyone see it yeah Hello. Yes, we can see. Just put it on. Yeah. Uh, like we can see it. Just put it on. Um, it's on, on uh, PowerPoint. Yeah, that's what I've done. Can you? Oh. On slideshow. Slideshow. Yeah, it's on slideshow, right? Can you not see it? Can you? Is it coming out different or? Yes, I think so. Why are you guys seeing it? Recording of your. We're seeing a recording of your screen. So perhaps you could stop recording and then put it on slideshow. Well, that, that was what AJ put record. Okay. Um, no, on your PowerPoint. The recording on your PowerPoint. Oh, on that one. Thing. Okay. So let yeah. me come out of that. And then uh, yes, well, I think the, is that is that okay? Yes, then just click on the slideshow. Yeah. Is that better? Okay. Yes. Okay. Sorry, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Sorry That's about that, guys. Sorry. Right. Okay. So what we have here is a 12 lead ECG. Um, and and it's, it's absolutely essential when you're looking at an ECG, even before you look at the rhythm itself, that you look at the calibration settings on it. So the calibration, standard calibration setting should be, if you look at the top, uh, if you look at the top here, um, it says 10 millimeters per millivolt and that. So it's either, when you look at an ECG, it's either you see this 10 millimeters per millivolt or you see this calibration, that's, that's your 10 millimeters. So that's, that's five millimeters there, that's five small boxes, and plus another five there. So that's 10, 10 small boxes, um, and that's per millivolt calibration signal. So always look for that um, when you look at an ECD, check to see if the calibration settings are, are, are standard. And the other thing you look at is your 25 millimeters per second as well. So that's known as the sweep speed. Um, so the sweep speed should always be 25 leaps per second. Elvis, we we're speaking about, and AJ will support me on this, like your when you look at your standard um, EP, um, EGMs, like they normally speed them up to about 100 millimeters per, per second. Um, per, milli, um, per second. So that means I have to slow down so that you can actually see it um, like that. 
So um, every E12 lead ECG that you look at um, should be 25 millimeters per second. Sometimes they might, they might increase it to 50 if the patient has an um, um, AVNRT, for instance, so that you can actually see it properly. Um, so it stretches it out so you can see it, but your standard calibration settings should always be 25 millimeters per second um, and, and the amplitude should, sweep speed, and the amplitude should always be 10 millimeters per millivolt. So if somebody has got like an LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, where the voltage is really high, then um, they might maybe reduce it to half that, the, the, the voltage gain or the voltage amplitude um, to five millimeters per millivolt. Um, so always watch that um, before you even go to interpret the ECG, otherwise you could end up mis misdiagnosing the ECG as it happened um, in the case that Dr. Davi sent um, a couple of days ago, um, that the doctor completely misread it. So always check 25 millimeters per second, switch speed and 10 millimeters, or you can see at the bottom as well, 10 millimeters per millivolt and uh, voltage gain. Um, the other thing to watch out for maybe is the frequency as well. Um, it, it is often between, you can see 150 hertz, um, where you can actually see as often said 0 0.1 um, hertz or 0 0.05 or 0 0.5 hertz to 150 hertz. So that, that's the bandwidth, the frequency range, range in which the signal uh, uh, is collecting signal. And um, sometimes you might get people that might actually put in like um, a filter on and we encourage you not to do that, to put a filter on if you can help it. Um, but a really good reason to put a filter, patient has a Parkinson's disease when they've got tremors, when you might want to put a filter on, but otherwise do a good skin preparation um, and, and then put, stretch out um, the frequency spread um, from 0 0.05 to or 0 0.5 to 150 hertz. So you can get as much signal as possible from a collective mass signal. You don't want to cut off any of the um, um, important signals. Right, so, so that's it there. So um, <clears throat> anybody got any questions here? Right, no, okay. So your 12 lead ECG. So AJ brought up that we should really um, look at how the ECG placements are with, with your 12 lead ECG. So the, the, the center bit here is your chest lead. Just to recap on what we, we said last week. So this is your chest leads and that consists of um, six electrodes. So you've got um, in your fourth intercostal space to your um, right, a patient's right. Um, is your um, V1 and then your um, fourth intercostal um, space to the, to the left um, is, is your um, um, V2. And then halfway through the midline um, of your clavicle, um, you, you, in fact, sorry, be, between, yeah, between the midline and the clavicle, you've got your V4 on the, on the fifth intercostal space and your V3 is between your V2 and your V4. Your V5 um, is in the same horizontal plane as your V4, um, and it's the fourth inter and fifth intercostal space, and it's like at the anterior part of your axilla, of your armpit, at the front of the armpit, um, in the same horizontal plane as um, V4. So that's your V5. And your V6, again, is um, in your uh, fifth intercostal space, um, in fact, it's in the same horizontal plane as your V4 and 5 and in the middle of the armpit, mid axilla. Um, and that, so it's always, that, that's the positions, the standard positions of the chest leads. And then your limb leads, you've got your right arm, obviously, you want to put it to the lower on your wrist, um, the right arm on your right and the left arm, lower part of the arm on your wrist. Um, and then you've got your neutral, could actually be anywhere on your body. Your left leg obviously is on the lower part of your leg, um, like by your ankle, um, um, if you want. But your right, your right leg, your neutral one could could be anywhere. So these are that's your standard position um, for your 12 lead ECG. Right. So yeah, so um, 
I, I, mm, I wasn't really gonna have that there, so let's speed on actually. Hang on. Enter the waiting room. Oh, admit, okay, somebody else is coming in. <clears throat> right, okay. So we're gonna go, obviously, um, just a quick recap again. So your, in fact, I wanna go to a different, is that AJ? Is that is that is that okay? Like what I've just done? That yeah. <laughs> Sorry, because I'm just trying to. <laughs> no, it's it's tough because people come in and no one can see you're clicking, so you just look like yeah. a crazy person who's just like clicking up here. I get you. All anyway. right. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um. Right. So. Yeah. So okay. Just to go around really really quickly. So you've got your limb leads. Um. With lead one and AVL are your high lateral leads. Um, so that normally covers your your obviously high lateral LV wall. So um, your arteries like your first diagonal um, from your LED, you know, um, if it's blocked, the, these are the important leads to look at. Um, your inferior leads as well. Your um, that's your right coronary artery. Um, so your inferior lead is lead two, lead three, and AVF. Um, AVR is an interesting one that looks at the base of the heart. Um, it is good for um, quickly um, diagnosing um, left main. Um, it's, it's very, very good for that left main. Um, if you've got, um, everybody thinks a redundant lead, but if you've got things like tricyclic antidepressant overdose, um, AVI is a good one to look at. Um, I, 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 um, as well as your antiarrhythmic um, drugs as well. Uh, Flecainide and so on, um, overdose, that, that's a really good um, lead to look at because you look at the ratio between the S wave and the R wave. Um, so that, that's, yeah, we, I mean, we can talk about that later on, but that AVR is a really good one to look at. Um, it's not a redundant lead at all because it looks at the base of the heart and it's always opposite to all the other leads. Um, so V1 as well, you can see uh, V1, obviously, um, that, that's good for the right ventricle. That's really good for the right ventricle. So if you get a right ventricular um, infarction, RV infarction, your V1 and V2 are, are good for that, as well as your inferior leads. Um, we're we're going to see proper evidence of all, all this later on. So I'm just doing a quick recap. Um, um, so your V3 and V4 really look at your septum. Um, and and your V5, V6 looks at the left ventricular wall. Um, so you can see the outline at the bottom there compared the ECG to basically the position of your heart, the anterior part and the posterior part. Um, <clears throat> and, and the reason why I think we go back here, when you, when you have your ECG transition, when you got your v, V3 and your V4, if I can, hang on. Click on that. Yeah. So if you look at in B here, um, you see how from V1, you have your um, tiny R wave and you have a deep S wave. And, and that ratio changes as you move along the heart from the right, from the right to the left. And um, when you get to maybe the apex from V3 to V4, you can see the transition of the S wave and the R wave is changing there, especially in V4. It's almost like it's a good transition there. So there's a normal transition when you're looking at your chest leads. Um, um, so somebody whose heart's rotated, maybe more vertical might look completely different to some maybe is rotated leftward, might have a delayed transition. Um, you know, and so these are um, things to look out for. It might be a normal variant for the patient. Um, and that's about, they should always get a transition norm, normally between V3 and V4, where you get a transition. So the R wave, so that, that's really a reflection of the left ventricular wall, because that, that's the left ventricle, because that's, that's the muscle mass of the heart. That's the muscle mass of the heart. So that's why, again, your R wave is actually coming up um, higher. And then it, 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 gradually, as you move towards your more lateral LV wall, the lateral LV wall, the V6 um, voltage, the QRS looks smaller because you're moving away from that. Is that, is that okay? Is that, yeah. Yes. So thank you. So when you have LVH, um, when, when you have LVH and people are diagnosed, if you're diagnosing by Sokolo criteria, for instance, they will look at your 
and by you know so criteria by voltage criteria they will look at your V5 and V6 and your R wave or your QRS the voltage of that then they add it to the S wave in V1 um, and and if it's above 3.5 millivolts three, yeah then that 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 counts as LVH by voltage criteria by circular criteria so so that that's the transition of the people with left ventricular um, hypertrophy obviously I've got thickened um, LV wall so you see that our wave would be much taller and that so that that's a really good um, case in point a good example <clears throat> Right, okay. So we went over this, which I borrowed from life in the fast lane as well. Um, how the anatomical um, location for MI um, is. So you've got inferior leads, obviously lead two, lead, um, lead three, AVF. So that, that's obviously looking at the inferior portion and the posterior portion of the myocardium and the right um, side of the myocardium. As you can see, the, there are three main arteries that supply blood to the heart. Your right coronary artery, your right coronary artery there, um, and your left main, which bifurcates or divides into two, into your LED and your circumflex, which is behind it. Um, and your circumflex um, and your RCA fight for dominance. Um, your RCA, um, in most people, tend to be more dominant. So you've got about 70% of, of people tend to have more RCA dominance. Um, so it might have yeah, um, your posterior descending artery, your PDA, um, which extends back all the way through the posterior portion. Um, um, and now, so it fights for dominance. And you can usually tell if somebody has got um, um, posterior MI, somebody has a posterior MI, you can actually tell if, is it, is it the RCA that's dominant or is it a second flight that's dominant based on the ST elevation? Whether, whether there's more ST elevation in lead one, or I'm sorry, in lead two or lead three. You can usually tell from that. Um, right, so um, in the future, we can also do um, learn about how to calculate um, electrical access, um, hexaaxial um, electrical system. Um, so we, we, can, we, can, we can work that out. And um, I'll teach you how to work that out. So, which is relevant for pacing, for CRT, this is really, really important that you can work out um, the access of the heart. If you're LV pacing only, if you're biventricular pacing, and um, what the 12 lead ECG is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to look like, you're looking at your V1 and your lead, lead 1, um, um, whether it's, it's a right bundle morphology, is narrow complex, is it more right access, and things like that. This is really, really re relevant. Um, sometimes you might even use this um, when when somebody has got heart failure um, to up by by changing the LV RV pacing offset to and you keep changing it um, where minus five milliseconds minus ten milliseconds minus twenty milliseconds and see how the QRS narrows or changes into right bundle branch um, in 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 V one. And, um, and lead one becomes more right access, like more negative. So some people say some patients can respond better with this. Um, some doctors think it's completely rubbish. <laughs> um, but I, knew, uh, Saint Jude, Saint, I think it came from St. Jude actually. St. Jude actually brought this, is that right, AJ? Um, when, when you're doing 12 lead ECG pacing, you know, LV, RV pacing to change the 12 lead um, to see if you can actually optimize um, by then pacing based on whether the QRS is narrowing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure where the, you know, who originated, but we do have an algorithm called quick opt, which is to kind of evaluate whether or not what the LVRV offset timing should be. And we don't use actual surface EKGs. It uses EGMs and a surrogate of that, you know, because we don't, one argument to all this is we don't actually we don't know where the lead is placed half the time, right? Because it was placed five years ago and now we're doing follow-up because they have heart failure symptoms. But what we're trying to do is get the most electrically narrow QRS. So we can use our surrogates in the EGM and then compare it to a surface 12 lead EKG and just try to optimize for the most, most narrow electrically um, efficient QRS, I guess is the way I'd say it. Brilliant, excellent. Yeah, thank, thanks, EJ. Yeah, cheers. Um... Right, okay, so <clears throat> let me go, sir. I'm just forwarding. Uh, 
You can see some lovely ECGs on the way there. <laughs> um, so this is the one we looked at um, last time. This is what was sent. Um, like the patient ended up dying um, in, in Nigeria, um, which is what we started off with, um, with like a recent inferior MI, which, which was missed. So we've just gone over this. Um, and, and we also went over this last, last week with the morphological or evolutionary changes with, with the um, acute MI, um, how from A, um, it looks QRS looks normal. You've got a tiny Q wave, which is normal, and you've got a T wave, upright T wave. wave. Um, if you've got any questions, AJ, <laughs> like, please ask, because I can see your video. I can, yeah, excellent, excellent, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, and uh, so that's good. No, 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 AJ, that's good. I like that because I can see. No, it's really good. It's really good. So with, within hours, you can see um, STEMI there, ST elevation there. Um, the QRS um, hasn't changed much. Um, and then from, from days, you can see how um, the, the, the QE becomes a little bit more exaggerated. Um, and the ST is still there, but it's morphing into a T wave inversion. And then from um, from one week to two weeks or more, um, you can clearly see that um, the Q wave is, is there, is pronounced, and the QRS is obviously smaller because there's been an infection, there's been like a scar formed, um, and you've got a more pronounced T wave um, there, T wave inversion there. And then once um, you, you're talking about after two two weeks to months or even a year, you Q wave. Um, remains in most cases it might remain um, and then um, your T wave goes back to normal as it flips um, it, it goes back to normal and uh, we spoke about LV aneurysm la last week as well um, how um, if it's an anterior MI sometimes you can get if it's an aneurysm you can get um, um, Q waves already there and um, with some slight ST elevation um, there which some people might misdiagnose as MI um, but that, that's clearly um, um, LV aneurysm. You can compare what it was before, um, and you can tell we, we we spoke about that last week. So this is this is really a summary of the morphological changes that happen um, with with MI acute MI. Um, so we went on to also look at some examples of it, uh, twelve lead ECG, of, and this is a um, what was this? Can anyone tell me? We went over this last time. Like, so I'm just wondering if anyone um, can remember what this is. What would you call this? Anterior MI. Yeah, anterior MI. But always, always tell the rhythm first. Um, so if somebody asks you, what, what is this rhythm? Um, what, what, what would you say, Elvis? Because they will ask you that in, in IBHRE. If you don't say it, then if you just say anterior MI, that's wrong. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a normal spinal reading. Excellent. That's it, with anterior MI. That's it. That's fantastic. Yeah, so that, that, that's what I want, to, I want you to say. <laughs> so preparing you for the IBHRE now. Because um, it's got you can see your ST elevation um, there. Um, it, it's more actually prop. Yeah, uh, you're not wrong there. It's anteroceptal because it's from V1 to V4. But yeah, if you said anterior, um, anterior MI, yeah, that that that's yeah, that's fine. Uh, it's interchangeable. A lot of people it doesn't matter. Few people use either and that. So it's more anteroceptal. It's a V4 to V5 is anteroceptal MI, and you can also see. Um, you can see like a, a slight um, um, changes there, reciprocal changes. It's not so good in this one. I remember when I was showing it, it wasn't so good, but you can clearly see in other ones that are coming, you should see a reciprocal change in, in your inferior leads. So this is an anterior MI. This is, so yeah, this is an anterior, anterior MI. Um, and it's got a slight um, lateral um, extension, so it's anterolateral MI actually, and you can clearly see um, reciprocal changes in your inferior leads there. Um, you can see that in um, lead three um, um, and also in lead two. Um, it's so much more in why well, um, lead three and AVF actually. Um, and the ST elevation isn't, isn't much, the level of ST elevation 
um, in anterior anterior lateral is not much in your level of reciprocal ST changes. And you, you always notice that um, isn't always equaled by that. Um, so this, we, we went through this an angiogram of an occluded. So anterior MI, we, we learned um, last week that is usually um, your LAD, your proximal LAD. Um, it could be your mid LAD as well. Anterior lateral involves your LED and your circumflex usually. I think uh, Dr. Duffy sent me an ECG um, during the week actually that, that had an anterolateral um, um, disease or occlusion on it. So that's an angiogram you can clearly see uh, proximal um, LED um, there. Um, it's not completely blocked, there's some, um, there's some perfusion there, reperfusion there, but you can see that it, it, um, right in the proximal um, area, you can see around right the postmodal area that it probably was once occluded, but there's a reperfusion there going there. So, uh, so the left main we were speaking about. So left main, you get ST depression and um, widespread ST depression, um, but you get ST elevation in your AVR, and most of the time in your in your um, V1, in your V1. Um, so that's a left main occlusion. So you get widespread ST depression, as you can see in all this, from your V V2, so probably usually from V2, all the way on your chest leads to V6, and then you get your high lateral and you get your inferior leads, but you get ST elevation in your AVR and your V1. So th this is your left main occlusion um, on that. So it's, that's a big one. That's that's a big one. That's a big one. So um, yeah, that's fine. So also, you can also get this exactly, um, this particular pattern for your ECG. Um, and this could also mean triple vessel disease as well. You can also get this for triple vessel disease as well. So there's an ex extensive disease um, on, in your coronary arteries with, with this left me. Is that a left me or triple vessel disease? You can get for this one. Yeah, is that is all right? Widespread ST depression, and you're looking at V1, usually ST um, elevation, and, and your AVR as well, ST elevation. Yeah? It's just, it's just remembering what it looks like. That's <laughs> patterns, um, so left main. So we can see on your angiogram here, we can see the left main occluded here. Um, well, in fact, it's, it's a reperfusion there, but you can see how this is the distal portion of the left main is really significantly like narrowed there. So Dr. Daffy will be able to fix it and, and prove a stent in there. Right? So we spoke about Wellens syndrome as well. Um, um, Wellens syndrome, so again, if you look at this um, V2 to V3, the two different types. So you can get, you're looking at V2 to V3. So you can get on, onset of chest pain. Um, the first one is your um, biphasic T wave. You can see there, your biphasic T wave, slight ST elevation there, and it's morphing into your T wave inversion. So that's a biphasic T wave in V2 to V3. That's Wellen syndrome. Um, and your um, the other type is your T wave inversion. Um, complete T wave inversion in your V2 to V3 is quite characteristic of your Wellens syndrome. So, this is your LED as well um, block. Um, and that's a look, look, watch out for that. And this is a really good example on a 12 lead ECG, what, what it looks like. You can see that biphasic T wave, it's like ST elevation there with your T wave inversion and V2 with and extends into your V4. So, Wellens syndrome. Proximal LED lesion. Um, and the other one to watch out for um, is your De Winter's T wave. So that's named after De Winter. Um, so you have like an absloping ST um, with a hyper acute, hyper acute T wave. Um, looks like hyperkalemia, um, with that um, sort of um, exaggerated T wave. And, and large T wave there, but you've got an ST depression there. 
which is upsloping there into and is morphed into that. So this is the winter to this. This is this is an emergent MI, um, proximal LED occlusion. This is this is this is serious. But this is often misdiagnosed. Um, AJ, you're scratching your head. <laughs> you should just ask the question. <laughs> This is way outside my wheelhouse, so I'm all right. I'll take the questions for off the off the camera later. Excellent. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so um, yeah, so the winter's T wave is often missed by by people, especially maybe registrars, E and E or whatever, or even cardiologists, registrars. Um, it is and it's an imagined MI, full blown MI. Um, maybe in a few hours you get full blown. Um, so do not do not mistake that this is this that is coming it's coming and so you get this particular um pattern with um sd depression absolute and sd depression morphing with uh, imagine with um, a hyper acute t wave and you're looking at v2 v3 uh, which might extend into v4 as well um so that's again that's LED. And you can already see reciprocal changes in inferior leads already. You can already see that happening. So sometimes it's really subtle, very, very subtle. You can't see it. <clears throat> so this is the posterior MI that we spoke about last week um, as well. So um posterior MI, you're really looking at your um so if you, you get in ST elevation inferior leads, but you're looking at your V1 to um, V1 to V3, um, and it might extend into V4. So you get ST depression in these chest leads, like V V1 to um, V3. Uh, it might just be V2 um, to V3, um, and it might extend into V4. So it's a point it's ST depression, and and um, um, what a lot of cardiologists do, because um, it's a posterior MI, you can do like a, a posterior ECG recording, like we spoke about, um, is in the same horizontal plane as your V4, V5, V6, so you have V9, V8, um, V9, V8. Um, I should really have a picture here, shouldn't I? <laughs> Sorry, I should really have a picture here. But um, basically, all you do is Instead of doing that record, you can do that recording if you want. You can do um, V8, V9, V8, V7, um, 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 right from in the same horizontal plane as a V4, V5, V6, um, where your scapula is at the end of it, um, your shoulder blade, um, and basically, you know, put the electrodes there. Um, or you can turn the ECG upside down, which you show ST elevation in, in your... Um, in your um, v, V1 to V3 or V4. So people turn it upside down like that, you should see ST elevation. That's usually a posterior MI. You tend to have an inferior posterior MI, you get um, ST elevation and inferior leads as well. Um, and then you might be able to diagnose whether it's, um, if, if you get ST elevation inferior, and like, as in this case, you get ST elevation in the lateral leads, the high lateral leads, is it circumflex or is it, is it, um, uh, right coronary artery dominance. Um, so um, some of the books will say if you get if you're getting um, lead two, um, shows a higher ST elevation. So so you've got ST elevation in, in the lateral leads. Um, it's probably the dominance is prob probably the circumflex one there. Um, because if you if the if it was the right coronary that's actually dominant because it's stretching from there. And it's the PDA is going all the way stretching the back, is not likely to extend stretch enough to the high lateral LV wall or the ECG to actually go an ST elevation there. So it's more likely um, it's actually the right coronary dominance. I'm sorry, it's more likely is a circumflex um, coming from the circumflex dominance. And that stretches to the right side as well. So you might get. Um, like an inferior ST elevation there. And um, life in the fast lane really covers that really, really well. Um, and that, so I, I would encourage you to go on that and have a look. Some, some books we say if lead two um, has a higher ST elevation and you don't have, in, so this is a posterior ECG record now speaking about. I actually forgot I had it already. So um, you remove your V4 to, um, 
uh, V6, and then that becomes V7, V8, V9. And you can clearly see your um, ST elevation there if you're doing a posterior recording um, on there. You can see your um, ST elevation there. It, so, um, uh, yeah. Is there, a risk, is there a, a risk of false positive with V1, V2, V3 being negative where you would need to do 7, 8, and 9? Or if you're negative in V1 through 3, is that a pretty strong indicator it's posterior? Spot on. Spot on. Yeah, so you don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. some, yeah, you don't need to do that. Some, 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 I don't know, registrars uh, might end up wanting to do that. Um, and that's why I mentioned that just in case somebody wants to do it, that this is, it will be opposite because it's looking at, because your V1 to V3 is looking at the front, the anterior part. So it's always going to be upside down. And if you want to, um, the, so the V7 to V9 are your posterior ECG recording. So that will really reflect head on what the ST, what, what the MI, where the MI is happening. So you get ST elevation in there, whereas your V3 to V, um, V1 to V3 is seeing it um, from behind it, like a mirror image of it. Um, so you, you don't need to record that actually, hardly anybody does. <clears throat> so, um, Infralateral again, and um, infralateral. So you, you can see your ST elevation in your inferior leads. Um, and then you've, um, why is this called Infer infralateral MI reciprocal? Oh, it's not infralateral MI, it's just, it's just, just an inferior. Um, you could even argue there's the inferior posterior MI. Sorry, this is headed wrongly. Um, so it's, it's an inferior posterior MI. Um, just pure why? Because you've got ST depression in your um, V V V one to V three, um, and if you put that upside down, if you put that upside down, you see that it will be slight ST depression um, there, um, and that. So this is more. So forget about that. This is an inferior posterior MI more, more than anything. Uh, yeah, is that is that all right? Is that yeah? Okay, so there's always a reciprocal change when you know you're looking at. There's always a reciprocal. By the fact that there is in your V1 to that um, to V3, you can clearly see um, ST depression. So there's, there's, there's a small component of a posterior. So um, it's probably the right coronary artery that's really dominant. That's gone all the way to the stretches the back. Um, yeah, I think that is what I explained that. Yeah, that, that says that. You agree with that, Dr. Dafi? Yeah. So it goes yeah. beyond the cross of the heart. Yes. So that we explain that for us. Yes, yes, excellent. Right, let's move on. Uh, so yeah, that's the right coronary artery. Um, I see it quite proximal. Um, right, okay. So we, we a high, uh, um, was that, is that okay? Yeah. Um, so that's a high lateral um, STEMI. So as I said, high lateral STEMI, you're looking at your um, first diagonal um, branch um, coming from, have I got a picture of that? Uh, no, 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 no. So LED, so you have your LED and you have, these are septal branches here. These are your septal branches of your LED and your diagonal will be coming from on the left side stretching sometimes the diagonal so most people have got either two or, or, or three branches and um, diagonal branches so if it's high lateral then it's usually like either your um, first diagonal or one of the obtuse ma marginal from your second flex um so it will be coming from one of right here and uh, if you the, the angiogram is done if you're looking at the second flex that will be coming from the left side. So that covers a high lateral LV wall, um, supplies blood to the lateral LV wall. And your first diagonal also usually is a bigger one, also supplies, can supply blood to the high lateral LV wall. Um, so that's um, so that's your high lateral STEMI. So you get ST elevation in lead one. And we, we, we covered this last time, um, lead one and AVL, you can slay. So you get, you get reciprocal changes in your um, inferior leads here. So lead three, AVF, and and, um, it's, and and the way you diagnose like MI doesn't mean that 
um, um, so how you diagnose is if you get changes, whether T wave changes or ST changes in two contiguous, contiguous leads. So it doesn't have to be three like inferior leads, if it's inferior MI, it doesn't have to be all three leads that have got ST elevation. So if two leads, if you've got ST changes in two contiguous leads, then that is di diagnostic of that. Yeah. So um, if you get Q waves in two contiguous leads, Q waves is more than a quarter or 25% of the, of the um, QRS voltage um, and, and you've got ST elevation, that's transmural um, inferior MI, if it's in inferior leads. Um, so it's only two contiguous leads. It doesn't have to be all three leads. That is MI, whether it's acute MI or recent MI. So only two contiguous leads. So that this is a high lateral um, lead. Uh, so this, this is old MI. Um, this is old MI, you can clearly see you there. Um, so old anterior MI, um, and you can pronounce um, Q wave there with some maybe probably like, um, um, yeah. So um, it's still resolving actually. It's, it's, uh, well, it, this could be LV aneurysm. This could be LV aneurysm. Um, deep, deep Q waves with um, a resolving like STT wave. So anterior M, old, old anterior LMI with maybe LV aneurysm component. Oh, there you go. Uh, um, so um, as you can see, like an aneurysm, aneurysm there on, on, the, on, the, on the right side of the LV, um, how it's actually protruding out. Um, and when you do an LV angiogram um, with a pigtail special type of catheter, which has got a nine hole, you inject the contrast dye, you can clearly see the accumulation of contrast dye in the aneurysmal uh, portion of the left ventricle. And that's what the ECG looks like. So is that the old anterior MI um, with an L, which is obviously uh, ended up being um, aneurysmal uh, from that. How old, sorry, I, I don't do caths at all. So how okay. old are we talking about here? When so you this, um, anything more than two weeks, two weeks old, or anything more than two weeks is old. If it's more than two weeks and it's old. Um, there is no reciprocal changes there. This is, so you're looking at massive Q way there. There's no reciprocal changes. If you're calling this like a recent MI, then there should be some kind of reciprocal changes in inferior leads, but there's nothing at all. Um, and you've got deep Q waves, really deep Q waves like that, um, with slight ST elevation there. Um, that's like definitely old MI um, on that, yeah. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, yeah. No, once again, this is not this is not my field of study, so it's very that's interesting. Right. I'm going to slow down the group. Um, but, yeah, I'll look it up later, the electrical, why there's not the reciprocal change, I guess, is my yeah. question. But like, let's, let's hit that later because I'm sure they all know this and we don't need to. So it's, 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 look, it's look, all right, yeah, yeah. Um, um, it's looking at it from the opposite side. Yeah, the, yeah. So I'm just wondering like why uh, an acute versus a chronic would have reciprocal versus, you know, the inver inverse of that. We'll we'll talk. Off all right, screen. okay. You made it morphological changes electrically, what's happening? Yeah. That's a yeah. very good question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there's, uh, there's a very, I don't think there's a lot of papers on it, actually. That's a very, very good question. So when MI is happening, it normally happens, no, normal conduction is from like endocardial to epicardial. Yeah. Like the transmural endocardial to epicardial. Obviously, mm -hmm. when you have MI, the conduction is affected. And um, so that every, everything is, um, but, um, so for instance, why, why do you get like a T, why is a T wave upright? And a Q wave is Q, you know, normal QRS is upright, and you've got T wave because depolarization and repolarization are are different. Yeah. So, yeah. but when you look at a QRS, it's positive, and your um, the T wave in most most of the leads are, are positive as well. But so if it's depolarizing, and then it's repolarizing. So in fact, the normal. Um, ionic changes conduction, obviously. Um, so the wave front is from the epic, um, endocardial to epicardial. Mm -hmm. And then um, when it's repolarizing, is really the direction of uh, the net direction of the wave front. So that's almost like reversing. But why is it 
why is it positive? Why is it Tiwi positive and not negative if it's kind of almost reversing from depolarization? It is a really good question. Like, a really, really good question. Um, oh. Nobody really <laughs> knows um, that. And, and MI is also like um, that in terms of ionic conductance, what is actually really happening on a cellular level. Um, why why is it like your ST, um, um, let me say it's largely to do with the calcium ionic change, calcium conductance, mm -hmm. um, and, and it causes your ST elevation part. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe maybe we can actually do a presentation on this because I'm I, I'm not too I don't know much but I can look okay. into it. We can do a presentation on it as well and discuss it. I'm down to look into it. I don't know yeah, if we're yeah, yeah, excellent. On it, yeah, but... Excellent. Yeah, we're looking to excellent. Right. Um, so this is an infralateral um, infralateral ischemia. Ischemia obviously SD depression. Um, you can see there somebody put somebody on an exercise treadmill. Um, that this is what you get, um, ST depression, ischemia as opposed to infarction. Um, ischemia is a reduced flow of blood infarction. There's a, a blockage, there's, a, there's no flow of blood to it, which is why in MI, every second counts because the, the blood supply is cut off um, and, and things like that. So this is ischemic, infralateral ischemia. Um, so... Uh, Probably if the patient is obviously exercising um, and that. So this is how this is ischemia, ST depression. Um, so, oh, we're speaking single chamber, the ventricular patient there, uh, dual chamber. Come on. Um, do, do you want me to go through? I think that's me pretty much done with the MI. Um, I, can, I can go on, um, should I, are we, no, I think we've, we've done enough, haven't we? I think we've done enough. Has anyone got questions of, um, am I? No, no question. Yes, we have, we have tried today. Very great. This is, this is really good. I, I honestly, I appreciate it. It's a lot of, a lot of the cast stuff is outside of what my knowledge base. So it's good to have this exposure, but um, I don't know what group questions they may have, but. Yeah. Elvis, have you got one? No, I, 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 no, I don't. I don't have any for now. So do you think, do you have, sorry? I, no, I, I said I don't have any for now. Okay. So, um, a really good one to look at, um, you know, your well end syndrome and your De Winter's T wave. A lot of people, especially De Winter's T wave, actually do miss it because it doesn't have the ST elevation component. Mm. So that, that's a good one to remember De Winter's T wave. Explain that De Winter T wave again. Okay, so that, that excellent. Thank, thanks, Dr. Daffy. So really what you're looking at is your hyperacute T wave, particularly in your V1, I'm sorry, V2, V3, and sometimes it extends into V4. So, um, you, you, I mean, normally when you see widespread um, hyperacute T wave, you think hyperkalemia. You think yes. hyperkalemia. But um, yeah, right. this is quite localized to V3, uh, V2, V3. And you've got like a slight SD depression, which is upsloping, um, upsloping into your T wave, hyperacute T wave, SD depression um, in, into that. So it's, it's really characteristic of um, the winter's T wave that that is an emergent MI that you need to act on it. Um, and um, yeah, before it becomes full blown, like proximal LED occlusion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, within, within hours. Um, so a lot of people do miss that. A lot of people do. Thank miss you. That. That's a good. Very, ve ve very good one. And uh, Wellen syndrome as well. Um, different types T wave. A lot of um, like African, uh, well, Afro Caribbean females um, might have like um, um, like T wave inversion from V V one to V three. So there are again. Um, yeah, so uh, again, um, AJ, there might, there might, there are different, different, different variations 
as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to make it complicated. I can actually do a presentation on that because it's really useful for benign early repolarization, differential diagnosis of that with MI, different, um, benign early repolarization, um, MI, and also um, pericarditis as well, pericarditis, um, and, and things like differential diagnosis, all of, all of it um, um, involve like an ST elevation component. Mm. I think. So I can do, I can do um, um, differential diagnosis on that. Like benign early repolarization, um, which they used to think that was benign. Um, let me see if I can, if I could go into life in a fast lane and bring. I don't know have I got that any. Uh, um, Honestly, you can present that to a lot of American doctors because I think that the differential diagnosis between like racial uh, background, like it makes a difference. And there's not yeah. a lot of training on it. A lot of the data and studies is based upon like white males. And then you try to apply that to other groups and it's dangerous because it's not the same. People don't know. Spot on. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah. I mean, you might have like an ST elevation, um, but what you look out for um, is that reciprocal changes. If you don't have reciprocal changes with MI, you usually do. Mm. Um, you usually do some kind of reciprocal changes looking at opposing leads. Mm -hmm. um, and you'd be able to say, so if you don't have that, even in the context of chest pain, then if it's an African, like, you know, then suspect that it might not be that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the ST elevation is also not, you look at it, it's not very convincing. So I'll show you one, what I mean by that. Um, Life in the fast lane, like people to use their website for educational purposes. So I, I, can, I can go on it and use it here. Yeah. So, and, 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 um, so Elvis, IBHR, oh, Elvis has got, Elvis has got his hand up. Sorry, Elvis. Elvis, go for it, speak. Yeah. I just wanted to um, call your attention to your chat. I All right, okay. To... Um, chat, okay, yeah, thank you for that. So prompt, please, um, gentle reminder. Um, Admit, please. I guess you might want to find a place to, or okay, yeah, I will, Elvis. I will. Um, let me just finish this really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, my computer is almost frozen. Um, okay. Um, P9, let's get, okay. So, yeah, so it's, it's really it's really subtle. Like, um, can you can you guys see it? Can you guys see what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, you can't. Oh, I've got, oh it's not. You can just drag it over to the screen if you have two screens, maybe. Um, I'm going. Come on, this. Oh, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Um, oh, you, did you open the PowerPoint inside? Oh, oh, and then drag it. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm going. Yeah. yeah, if you open the PowerPoint inside of Zoom, it could be harder, but. So how, how do I get rid of that and let you see what I'm, what I'm seeing on the Life in a Fastly online? Um, you can try minimizing this. Minimizing, I don't know. Minimizing this. Yeah. And um, do that. Uh, can you say it? No. Nah. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll do a presentation on it. So for benign early repolarization, you're looking at like characteristics, like um, uh, there's a thing called a J point. Um, a J point would be um, this, this this bit here. It's a J point. Just just after the um the, the qrs um if you see that narrow qrs there so your g point would be where the kesa is at the moment that's your g point that that marks the end of depolarization and the onset of repolarization that's your g point so you might have like a notch so g point is pronounced for instance in benign early repolarization or um like hypothermia hypothermia mm. uh, you can you can get G point um, 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 there, 
Um, yeah, so we yeah we can we can we can look up stuff like that. How to do differential diagnosis with early reprisation um, and pericarditis and, and various sort of things. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, also, juvenile T wave inversion also tend to people juveniles tend to have T wave inversion from V one um, to V three. So that's another differential diagnosis. And the T wave as a as a particular characteristics, whether it's actually symmetrically inverted or is um, asymmetrically inverted. So all T waves, whether it's upright or, um, um, or should have, like, um, if it's upright, should have, should be asymmetrical. Yeah, okay. should be asymmetrical. Um, the uh -huh. T wave should be. Um, so for instance, the gradient, so the gradient initial portion let me see if i can get like yeah, a, you mean like the the slew rate of the wave almost like you're looking yeah, at spot on yeah yeah spot on yeah so the initial portion um should be um oh, if i can get a classic one to show you um so so the initial portion will have a um will have a, a, a lesser gradient than the terminal portion of the T wave, if you like. Mm -hmm. The upslope impact will be having that. So, so you look at things like components of the QRS or the ECG like that. My, I'm, I'm absolutely crazy for this. And we can spend ages, we can, <laughs> I can, I can, we can talk a lot about this ECG. Um, so I did a presentation in, at the Scottish um, uh, Cardiological Society on, on this. And I can easily, I can present, I can do a presentation like on this for us as well. And so we can all build up our knowledge on this because I'm crazy about ECG. Um, but awesome. I, do think, I, do, I do think the VT, differential diagnosis with VT and, and um, SVT with vibrancy, that's a really good one. That's a very useful one. That's a very useful one. Yeah. Right, I'm, I'm going to end it here. Versus, um, I think that'll be a good one to compare SVT versus VT aberrancy on the EKG, as well as on EGMs as well, right? Because EGMs don't oh, yeah. correlate, but you still have these similarities. So um, I love that. I have a good presentation on HV that we can probably pull some slides from too. Okay. If we can. Brilliant, yeah. That, 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 that would be great. So you and Jilos will work it off for next week. Well, next, oh man, Dr. Duffy, we do have other <laughs> things going, you know? Oh my word. I, if you want to explain that to my wife, then yeah, that works I, for me. Yeah, I agree well, with you. Yeah, we, we will see. We will see because um, I've got a lot of things going on here. So we will see. I'll speak to okay, you. Okay. So about what will happen, um, uh, Asia and Jillos? What will happen? So let me take um, cardioversion and the uh, defibrillation next week Sunday. Then upper Sunday, you take it. Okay. Okay. Mm. Excellent. Brilliant. That we're, we're, we're finished. So if I've, I'll send you the slides, and if anyone has any yes. questions, they, they can always. So text people me. can post the question to you, yeah. and you will respond. You can respond to them privately yeah. or in the group. If something you group. want all of us to learn from, respond in the group. We will learn from it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, AJ. Thank you for your. Yeah. Reading. Thanks, AJ. Thank thanks, Elvis. Thanks, uh, Doctor Dolly. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Gerard, we are grateful. Thanks, to Gerard. Everybody. Nice to see you on this. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Sutoy. Everybody has kept to this point. We are Thank grateful. you, everyone. It's been good. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So, cardiothoracic surgeon, was that is that something you might come across, uh, Joe? Like ECG? Yeah. Or... Absolutely. Yeah. No, you're brilliant. Yeah. You are truly truly obsessed with the wonderful world of ecgs but in a great way so yeah, yeah that was really helpful it was cool i like i like i'm a i'm a pedant i love detail <laughs> no really well done that was great very interesting i think aj liked it too <laughs> yeah i wish i understood most of it but i liked it so. <laughs> okay all right great stuff well well done when are you doing it next by the way two weeks time is that right aj two weeks uh, yeah, I think he, Dr. Davis said he wanted to do next week for his own. Um, so I'm happy to hop on. And then two weeks' time should be in town. Down to do it. Oh, yeah. Are you going to create the code, AJ? Will you be all right to 
Yeah, you can actually do a, a reg. you can post the same one. So one little tiny tip is if we don't want to constantly have to tap to invite people in, you can do it another way. You can do it a way which they just need a password and they can hop straight in and it avoids mm. you having to constantly click. So there are lots of ways to set it up. Okay. So